wahrscheinlich, weil die finanzielle Unabhängigkeit sehr stark interessiert. Bataraja, ich bin professionell Retail, der seit ca. 15 Jahren verdiene somit ja, meine Brötchen damit, sagen wir so. Du hast wahrscheinlich schon einige Werbungen gesehen mit, ja, hier drei Monate, hier Signale von mir, Daytrading, ich sage hier so für uns, wenn wir sagen wir so. Aber wenn du dich in diesem Thema Daytrading, speziell Volumentrading, weiterbilden möchtest, dann kommst du an der Mr. Volume Akademie definitiv nicht vorbei. Also, ob du Anfänger bist, ob du Profi bist, etc., vor Ort oder der Fern. Known for a long time that I wanted to be a part of the shift towards renewables to help combat climate change. And I think to me it's very clear that a breakthrough battery technology that allows cars to go further, last longer, stay safer, charge faster will help.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, part of the conference. My name is uh, Christian Andersen. I'm from uh, Geo Delft QTech, and I will be chairing the session this morning on all the things we do to take our wonderful qubits and put things around them uh, so we can actually control them read them out, learn about them. And the first uh, talk today is from uh, Professor Johannes Fink at uh, ISDA, who will talk about how we can take our qubits that operate at microwave frequency and interact that with light at telecom frequencies. So uh, Johannes, please take it away. Thanks for the nice introduction and the uh, uh, chance to give a talk here in front of such an expert audience. Um, yeah, I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about light a lot, and uh, specifically about this electro-optic interconnect here, uh, which we operated millikelvin temperatures. So this is the outline. After some introductions, I want to discuss three um, um, experiments. Um, where we show coherent and uh, quantum-enabled conversion between microwave and telecom wavelength light, um, how we entangle microwave photons with light, and how we read out qubits uh, without any cryogenic microwave equipment. This work was uh, done at uh, the Institute of Science and Technology Austria. It's about 20 kilometers away from Vienna. And this research direction has been I started in my group together with Harald Schwefel at the time by these two, uh, by uh, Alfredo and William. And now what I'm presenting you today is mostly Richard and Leo's work. Leo's work. Uh, the qubit readout was done by Georg and Thomas mostly. And we have a collaboration with Peter Abel and Juri uh, for the entanglement. So let me start by trying to convince you that uh, quantum limited microwave photonics might be interesting for you. Um, the first uh, most general motivation for me to go in this direction was that it seemed natural that we want to process quantum information uh, electrically. Superconductors and gates are fast, but we want to transmit it optically, somewhat similar to classical computational systems. And uh, we had other approaches in the past based on mechanical oscillators, but now we like these electro-optic transducers the most, and I will introduce them later. There is now a second uh, motivation, maybe, that is more on the classical interconnect uh, level, and that is um, to also control and read out uh, superconducting devices. And, and this is maybe a little bit similar to, to what happens also in classical computation um, that is, you, you, you want to go more and more optical because this can uh, remove some, some bottlenecks uh, in networking. And it, it, it also removes this constraint of physical um, uh, distance uh, to be, di to be, to be clo physical closeness. So it allows you to, to have software-defined infrastructures. Uh, it doesn't really matter if your processors are very close or not. So how about we try to remove the clutter in our fridges and go to a situation where you use an optical fiber and some uh, uh, modulation device, a transceiver that can produce and, and receive uh, microwave photons. Um, and, and there's actually a classical technology for this. It's called radio over fiber technology, and it, you use it to go to harsh environments to, to, to set up a Wi-Fi network there or so. <clears throat> or to synchronize uh, telescope antennas in a very large array. Um, and, and in that spirit, uh, we might be able to do something. So our electro-optic uh, interconnect is based on the Pockels effect. It's, uh, uh, it, it exists in, in non-centrosymmetric crystals like lithium niobate. If you, if you apply a voltage to such a crystal, due to the chi-2 nonlinearity, it's nonlinear polarizability, uh, an optical light will experience a phase shift because the index of refraction changes as a function of that voltage. Now, for the purpose of this material, uh, gigahertz frequency signals are like DC, and uh, 
and, and that allows you to do three-wave mixing experiments as long as you conserve uh, energy. So, for example, you could have a strong optical pump and apply a weak uh, microwave tone, and if they interact appropriately, you, you, you generate an optical sideband. We call this up conversion. You can do down conversion. You can also parametrically amplify or, or have a spontaneous parametric down conversion. So to be, for this to be efficient, you need spatial mode matching, phase matching, the polarization, and the tensor elements need to be addressed correctly. And, and one thing, apart from doing this, one thing we, that is special is we also resonantly enhance this interaction. So we put this material inside both an optical cavity and also a microwave circuit. And um, this has a number of advantages. It gives you longer interaction times between the two light waves or electromagnetic fields. Um, it's more power efficient and um, you, it allows you to select the desired process up, like for example, uh, amplification or conversion or cooling. And there is a nice analogy to cavity optomechanics here. It's actually the same physics, except now instead of having a mechanical displacement, you're dealing with a voltage in, in the crystal. Uh, or instead of the momentum of that mechanical oscillator, you have a current in your uh, electrical circuit. And so we can define the same physics and the same uh, like, uh, figures of merit, like the cooperativity of, of such an interaction, which, which we want to be close to one. So to wrap up the motivation part, um, the, first, the first one I already gave you, and also IBM and others recognize this, that a lot of modularity is needed in these quantum processors to reconfigure the tasks and the, uh, the way they operate, and, and the, the topmost layer might require links between fridges, um, which uh, likely need to be optical for appreciable distances and also to reconfigure them easily. Um, it, if you have such an interface, you can also um, you know, work closely, closer to this uh, vision of hybrid devices where you use each physical system for what it's best at. So you can link, uh, I don't know, the NMR spin with your micro circuit to an optical photon for, for a longer distance communication or so. Or to, or to an ion or, or, or something similar, to also to other platforms to do, for example, platform verification uh, without going to the classical domain. So this is pretty far out, but um, I, I like basic physics questions in this sense, so um, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to sell you that this will be the next thing you should focus on, but maybe down the road it becomes uh, interesting. So I already mentioned the uh, input side, the control side, and there has been nice work, for example, with uh, absorptive um, uh, photodiodes that demodulate optical signals. It would allow you for a lot of multiplexing. If you use an electro-optic device like ours that maps to the physics of cavity optomechanics, you can also um, um, apply that analogy and similar somehow to LIGO and other force sensors which, dis which sense displacement you can build RF sensors, which, which sends um, um, uh, voltages without the need for electronics, basically, uh, purely photonic sensors. You might want to check the microwave background on a satellite using things like this. Um, you guys are really amazing at synthesizing interesting quantum states. And, and in some sense, in some areas, it exceeds what optics people can do. So you could transfer those states to the optical domain. And finally, if you are an, able to connect different sensors in the quantum limit, uh, it could allow for Heisenberg scaling to do quantum sensing uh, entanglement assisted. OK, there are multiple approaches how to build such interconnects. Uh, and I'm just highlighting some of the, the, the most well known here. It's to use mechanical motion that couples both to optics and microwave circuits, piezoelectric. Uh, which, which is at higher frequencies typically. Cold atoms is, uh, is one of the, uh, uh, is another way to go, like Rippig atoms. We're talking about electro optics. And, and one, it's, it's hard to compare where the field is. There are different figures of merit. Everyone has his favorite one, and my favorite is to look at this device similar to a phase insensitive amplifier. So you send a signal in, you have a S parameter, eta here. Um, 
typically you guys deal with large eaters. You have a large gain, but you could also have loss. And you have some e equivalent input noise. And, and then you just multiply eat, eta with the sum of those two signals, the noise and the, the input signal. So I tried to um, uh, visualize this uh, model here. And, and, and what you see in the x-axis is the transaction coefficient. And on the y-axis, it's the, it's the technical noise added in reference to the input, similar to the noise temperature of your amplifier. But there's also this, this quantum noise component. This is from from a paper from Carlton Caves. And typically, you don't worry about this, because if you have a large gain, this is 1 half. And that's the typical vacuum you add at the beginning of your amplifier that gives you the quantum limit. But if you have a lot of loss, this term really blows up. So the, the y-axis and the contour lines on this plot are uh, in the top left are dominated by, by this uh, quantum noise term. So, so a hemp, for example, might somewhere be somewhere up here, and, and a JPA, if it's quantum limit, somewhere down here. Um, and, and, and you see this little dot. That, that is a, an experiment by EPFL where they use a commercial electro-optic modulator and put it inside the fridge at 4 Kelvin and used it similar to as a transducer. And you can also calculate the effective uh, transduction coefficient and f equivalent input noise. And you see we are, I don't know, around six to seven orders of magnitude away from where we want to be, which is the quantum limit. Note that this quantum noise goes to zero if your gain is one or if you have no gain. And that is actually where we want to operate such a transducer. <clears throat> Note that when I talk about transaction coefficient, I mean the photon number and not power as such, because we go from 10 gigahertz to 200 terahertz. There's definitely a lot of power gain, but not in the, no in the number of photons. So uh, these are some of the experiments that have been done. And, and uh, one takeaway is, OK, nobody has been in this uh, very far corner where you would send in a Wigner function and it comes out non-classical. But we, we have a number of experiments that went below added technical noise of one photon. And that is already a super interesting regime because uh, like in all quantum communication experiments, you have a lot of loss, and the, the way you beat the loss is by not doing heterodyne measurements, for example, but you, you do photon counting, and then you don't care about the vacuum you mix in. So heralded measurements work down there, so we are ready to do quantum experiments. And the two highlighted ones is what I will discuss today. So let me explain the device we're dealing with. Um, it looks like this. It's a 5 millimeter diameter lithium nibate disc that we polish mechanically to get really high Q. And uh, it, has, uh, it is sandwiched inside an aluminum 3D cavity that has these rings and is a bit mode engineered to have good overlaps. It looks like this uh, with an SMA connector there. Um, and we use the M is equal one mode of the microwaves, and we, we squeeze that inside the rim of this disk to have good mode overlap and small mode volume. Um, so the disk is made of lithium nibate with a chi 2 nonlinearity. We operate it at 1550 nanometer, which is the standard telecom wavelength, and it has uh, resonance frequencies, a lot of them, a different mode families. Um, and we work with the TE modes and a mode number of about 20,000. Um, here it's, it's visualized with 20. And <clears throat> uh, when we mechanically polish this in our lab, we get up to close to 10 to the 9 optical Q. So this is a, a very macroscopic device compared to integrated photonics, but it's also a very interesting device in terms of integrating it with microwaves because microwaves are large. It's a, really the wavelength is 20,000 times different roughly. And um, so, and you want to mode match these things. So, and um, the devices I will tell you about have about 100 times lower Q, which means 10 to the four times more power necessary than in our next generation where we hopefully work with higher Qs. Now, the, the, the vacuum coupling efficiency here um, between a single photon uh, in, <clears throat> in, in the microwave and, and in the optical domain is given by, by this equation here. So it depends on the zero point fluctuations of the electric field uh, in, the, in the microwave. So lower mode volume helps, for example. The, the, dielectric, sorry, the dielectric constant, optical energy, and the 
R33 component which we use uh, of the, of the electro-optic tensor. And it's only around 40 hertz or so. So um, out of these op many optical modes, we make sure that the free spectral range between them actually matches the microwave frequency. That makes it a triply resonant system. We pump on resonance, we retrieve sidebands on resonance, and, and uh, so that makes it very efficient. <clears throat> so we can have two different interactions depending on uh, if, if the pump mode interacts with the Stokes or the anti-Stokes mode. And um, this can be an amplification interaction, two-mode squeezing, or a beam splitter interaction. So in the beam splitter interaction, you would have a higher energy. Uh, uh, um, you, 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 would, you would basically have to pump on the red detuned side, and you would, for example, split the photon into the pump mode and the microwave mode. So you convert from the upper sideband to the microwave. And this can also happen in the reverse direction. And this can be a noiseless process, too. If we, if we somehow manage to turn off the, 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 higher or the higher mode, we pump on the blue side compared to the mode of interest, the green one, we get an amplification interaction. So if there already is some field there, we have stimulated parametric amplification. And if there is no field there, then we amplify the vacuum. And that is a spontaneous parametric down conversion or two-mode squeezing. And that will lead to entanglement between the microwave and the optical domain. OK. so. Um, let's go on to the conversion measurements. So we turn off the amplification interaction by, we use a dispersion uh, engineering where we couple one of these modes to a TM, the TM mode family, such that it doesn't interact, it has a slightly different FSR. So we get, so we can shut this off, it's the density of states is low. Um, <clears throat> we pump on the red side. Um, and the cooperativity scales with the number of pump photons, so the, the vacuum coupling is quite low, but as we increase the pump, we increase the chance that this process happens, essentially. And if the cooperativity is one, it compares the scattering rate with the, with the loss and the coupling, in and out coupling rates, um, we, we make it more and more likely that this happened, this conversion process. And actually, the ideal con um, cooperativity for this conversion would be one when, you, when the match is rate the, the photons that come in, uh, that rate matches uh, the conversion. All right, so in the beginning, we used continuous wave pumps, and the cooperativities were low, and the conversion efficiency you see in the do down on the left, it's given by two components, the coupling efficiency and the internal efficiency. The coupling efficiency means like how many of the photons you apply in the, actually make it into the cavity or out of the cavity. So, and what I will report on is the conversion efficiency between the input port, the microwave port, and the output port, which is here, the, this free space prism port. So if C is low, this, this term really doesn't matter, and everything is proportional to the pump power and the number of photons we pump with. Um, and this is what we see. It looks a bit boring. And uh, um, here is internal and the total uh, conversion efficiency. And this is bidirectional. It works in both directions. The only interesting feature we see is here at around 1 milliwatt, where actually the, um, the aluminum cavity uh, loses superconductivity. <clears throat> so the conversion efficiency here is not the greatest um, compared to the best uh, uh, results in the field. Um, but, but the uh, it is really good uh, compared to some of the first results in the field. And on the other hand, the bandwidth is really good compared to the best conversion efficiency devices, and it's quite compatible with superconducting circuits. We also look at the noise properties, back out all the noise mode occupancies, and what we find is that for one milliwatt milli pump power, we have about five optical, sorry, five, mi the microwave mode um, outputs around five photons per second per hertz. And that seems like, OK, that's not so bad for a one milliwatt pump. But now, in my earlier explanation, we should reference this to the input. So we need to divide by the conversion efficiency, which was low. And then we end up with 10 to the, five, 10 to the 4. And, and that, that is the competing noise source uh, that competes with your quantum state that you want to send in. And that is, that is pretty horrible, in a way. So that's also why we are high up there with this result. So, but we have one trick up our sleeves, and that is if you look at the time domain of the noise, 
after you turned on the dash line indicates when we turn on the optical pump, you see that this is extremely slow. So we have a bandwidth of 10 megahertz for conversion, but it takes about one uh, half a minute until superconductivity breaks. Or in other words, we have about one photon per second of heating rate, which is much slower than the conversion rate. So we can do pulse measurements where we convert much faster than, than the heating rate. And that's what we do. We also, when we do pulse, we can also bump up the power more. We work with close to 100 milliwatts, and we get all the, almost to cooperativities of one, where we are, uh, and we achieve, uh, so this is conversion between microwave to optics. In one case, the, the cavity is preloaded with microwave photons. In the, in the other case, we turn on the interaction first, and then we send the signal that, that leads to this overshoot due to preloading. <clears throat> And we, we, we get excellent uh, agreement with theory here, and it also works in the other direction. Now we have like 15 to 20 percent uh, of conversion efficiency. Most importantly, it's phase coherent, so we can IQ modulate the microwaves and get an IQ modulated optical signal out, or we can IQ modulate the, the optical signal and get a microwave out. Also, the long-term stability is okay here. So if we dial in a new phase, we get, a, we get out a new phase. For even shorter pulses, we can push up more to cooperativity really uh, touching one. And, and there you see another, uh, um, if, you, if you then plot this as, as a function of pump power, and you, you see that, without going into all the details here, is that the blue shaded region indicates a little bit of amplification we have and actually don't want. And that's due to, uh, because we cannot completely shut off this other mode, the, this mode suppression with the two mode squeezing interaction. You also see that the internal efficiency for, for these things is basically uh, uh, one. So we are told the only thing we're limited by at this point is um, coupling efficiency to the cavity. And some of these overshoots, it's also quite interesting, is due to the onset of strong interactions. Like once your cooperativity is larger than one, for example, it's more likely that the the microwave photon is not only converted to optics, but converted back instead of being retrieved. So you would see some, some signatures of, of strong coupling. And we're not quite there yet, but, but uh, that's something we want to explore in the future, between strong coupling between two light fields. The last thing about high cooperativity I want to highlight here is another effect that you expect and we know from cavity optomechanics. It's, it's electro-optic dynamical back action. So, what you see here, for example, is, is a measurement of the, micro, of the, of the uh, left detuned optical mode in the presence of a pump here in the center, uh, which is applied during this time. And you see the little dot wandering here. And if the pulse is on and the optical photons are present, you, we see that the optical mode is narrowing. And, and this is because of electro-optically induced absorption. Um, so the way you can see this is that the electro-optic interaction is so strong, it's like an additional dissipative term or a coupling term, and, and, and it has a sign. It can be negative if, if the detuning is appropriate or positive. And for example, if we apply the det if you look at the mode that is detuned from the pump in the other direction, you see what you maybe have heard of uh, electro-optically induced transparency. I mean, electro-optically induced hasn't been shown yet, but uh, optomechanical, for example, or electromagnetically induced in atomic systems. So th these are highlights of, of strong interactions. And, and the, the last plot I show on this slide is this one, which is quite boring, but at least as important. This is now looking at the microwave mode in the presence of this symmetric configuration. And it's very important to see that we put in 100 milliwatts of optical power and the mode shape uh, does not change. And that's because it's a, a Q and D type interaction, because these two terms to the, uh, cancel, basically. Now, if we shut, I am not have time, but if we shut off one or the other of these interaction terms, we can actually also broaden or narrow the microwave mode of a 3D superconducting cavity co in a coherent process by applying laser light which is quite cool, I think. OK, so we didn't find relevant excess back action except for this coherent part. So what about the noise performance? Um, so we have two contributions here. One is the average heating, uh, because that depends on how fast we repeat the experiment. 
you repeat it very fast, we have, for example, here two photons per second per hertz coming out, thermal photons. But when we apply the pulse in the shaded region, something very interesting happens. The noise that comes out is reduced. And this is because we convert noise to the optical domain. And this is the effect of, of optical sideband cooling. And we can verify this um, uh, also in the optical domain. And we did. Um, so we sort of laser cool the mode temperature of, an op of a microwave mode using a laser here. If you repeat the experiment very rarely, then the overall noise temperature is very low. And because we don't have a perfect sideband suppression, we still have a little of this parametric amplification interaction. And there we see the opposite. We see that we have more noise coming out, and this we attribute to amplified vacuum. And, I will show, and that is the topic of the, of the next section, which I need to speed up. OK, so basically going pulsed, we, we were able to improve by another three to four orders of magnitude, uh, going pretty close to the quantum limit, and most importantly, go below this demarcation line uh, where you can start to do heralded quantum experiments and entanglement. OK, so <clears throat> if you want to connect two uh, superconducting uh, uh, qubits in two fridges, um, then uh, you could, uh, we know already, you cannot uh, use uh, microwave photons. They get in equilibrium, and eventually they, uh, they are overwhelmed with thermal noise, about 1,000 quanta per, per mode. Um, conversion would help. Converting going up, uh, you need two converters and an optical carrier. And I, as I tried to tell you, this is really hard. Why? Because you would really need to operate in this limit uh, so you don't even add the vacuum at each, each of these uh, conversion steps. However, there is another way, and that is if you share entanglement between the two nodes, you don't need to be in that, in that limit. We can distribute entanglement and then use teleportation for state transfer. And, and uh, this is what I'm going to show you now. The main challenge is, again, to show too much, we, we work in the continuous variable domain here, so there's no heralding, and it's in a sense a deterministic system where we don't remove bad measurements. So the, the main challenge will be heating, and I, I, will, uh, I already showed you that we don't have a lot of that. The reason, I didn't really give you a good reason for it, uh, because I think one reason why this experiment works for us is because we work with a fairly bulky system, so there's a large heat capacity and it's heating up slowly. That also helps us to avoid thermal optic and thermal refractive effects. OK, so <clears throat> now for uh, coming from conversion, now we pump on the, uh, uh, on, the, on the higher frequency mode, and that is expected to give us uh, two mode squeezing. On the, on the two output ports, uh, we do heterodyne measurements and balanced photo detection uh, on the optical domain. And if you calculate what you expect to see when there is no pump present, you, these are calculated Wigner functions, is just two blobs corresponding to the vacuum state. If you turn on the, the pump, you expect that vacuum to look like a thermal state, like it's a little larger. And then when you look at the correlations, you, you should see that there is some two-mode squeezing, and that is a signature of, uh, of entanglement between the two modes. Now what happens if, you, if you're not absolutely in your ground state is, for example, the optics for sure will be in its ground state at 200 terahertz, but uh, we know that we heat up the, the microwave. And even if we heat it up just a little bit, the, the optical pump will amplify that thermal field and distribute it over both modes, and then if, even though you have the squeezing interaction, you will not be able to, to squeeze below vacuum. <clears throat> so this is our enemy, and the way we beat it is to go to really short pulses, 250 nanoseconds, and we repeat it very slowly, only two times. Um, uh, per second, and we, uh, we measure this a few million times, and, and we get these, these signals coming out on the microwave and optical side, and um, <clears throat> we back out from single shot data, uh, we do the Fourier transform before, during, and after the pulse to back out the thermal occupancies, which is about th uh, 3% when we start. And um, uh, on the optical side as well. And then we, we also extract the quadratures. Uh, for the Gaussian state, we can uh, use the normal form and simplify this a bit and, and boil it down into three parameters, the microwave noise photon number, the optical noise photon number, and the correlations. And this is basically the, the power spectral density in terms of quadrature uh, variances. 
um, uh, where you see the microwave and optical on top, uh, photon number, and the correlations in yellow. So the do and Simon criterion tells us that if uh, the sum of those two minus two, two times the correlation is one that would, you would expect for the vacuum, and if it's smaller than one, you, you have some entanglement because you squeeze below the vacuum. It's a non-classical state that is inseparable. And here you see the result. Um, you also see that the data uh, goes nicely below one. Uh, it's actually close to five to six sigma in terms of our error bars, which here are two sigma, uh, both including uh, statistical and um, systematic errors. Um, but we don't have as much squeezing as we would guess from theory, and we attribute that to a loss of uh, uh, phase coherence. You also can plot the anti-squeezing, which also agrees very well with theory. So on resonance, we have the highest amount. Uh, we can reconstruct the Wigner functions and the covariance matrix. And to give you an intuitive, um, an intuitive number, what this means, it's, it means that we entangle about 0.1 e-bits in each 200 nanosecond pulse. And the main limitation is, of course, that we can send these pulses not very fast. <clears throat> All right, so the last experiment. Um, that I promised was the all-optical readout. So we all know there are a lot of things in our fridges to do the readout, starting with uh, attenuator, thermalization, filters, and so on. And we want to replace that with this device. And this was just for us. I'm not saying that this is the, the way to go, and uh, if, you, if you sell cables and that's your business, then I wouldn't worry about it too much yet. But. Um, this was just the first experiment for us to do because we want to add qubits. We want to entangle qubits with optical photons, of course, but readout is a classical task in a way, and, and we want to see that the qubit survives it. So um, there has been related work by the Tufel group, by the Leonard group, and Oscar's group. Um, some focus on the input, some focused on replacing part of the output, uh, some uh, was destructive to the qubit and superconductivity in general. So we have, uh, we, we try to combine these things now. Um, so you will see three experiments. One is typical microwave readout, one where we replace the output, and one where we replace both. And uh, I have to run quickly over this, I believe. So um, we use a high power readout scheme because our converter actually degraded over time uh, in every subsequent cooldown. We can discuss why and how we solve that. But for now, um, we needed, we used this Chains Cummings nonlinear readout in a reflective configuration, which is a bit uncommon. Anyways, here you see the time, the time slot scale, uh, a time domain plot between the prepared EG and E state. You see we reflect off the transducer, but it's not operated, the laser is off. And then we can uh, get from the difference in these time traces the histograms, and we have close to 90% uh, state fidelity, which we mostly attribute to state preparation errors and things like this. It's not a highly uh, optimized um, thing. Then in the second experiment, we, we actually send in the, the microwave readout pulse, and uh, we turn on the transducer and analyze the signals optically. This is what we get. We are not quite critically coupled anymore, but we still have nice distinguishability, a little bit reduced. Because we use a lot of photons, it still works, even though our measurement efficiency is quite low. And in the last experiment, we open this switch to effectively kill this circulator. So we, we have a reflective path here, and we modulate and demodulate at the same time the optical field. This costs some reduction in distinguishability, but we still get around 82%. Uh, percent. Uh, readout fidelity here. So a 3% reduction over the previous one. If you do a T1 measurement uh, in either way, we get the same result. Ramsey is a bit disappointing, uh, even by our standards, but it's consistent in all the different types, even if the laser is off. So the qubit doesn't see instantaneously very bad effects. We also then very carefully backed out the thermal occupancy of the different modes involved. And we see that uh, very clearly here that as we, these are average measurements, we have, we use the laser simply as, a, these are microwave measurements, and we use the laser as a heating source of variable uh, repetition rate. And you see that basically we have some absorptive heating in the disk, which heats up the fridge, and once the fridge is hot enough, the, the green, then also the qubit, uh, based on EF, Robbie, and uh, the, the cavity uh, the qubit sits in, based on 
uh, uh, populated Ramsey measurements uh, increases. And only then also we see that the uh, T1 and T2s decrease. So our conclusion from these measurements so far is that we have an average heating effect, but we don't see at our, the level we ha can look at it instantaneously bad effects uh, on the qubit at the moment, even though, I repeat, there is only a microwave cable connecting these two elements, no shielding in place, no circulators, and nothing. So in summary, we have, um, uh, I showed you high conversion efficiencies and low noise, laser cooling of a microwave cavity, dynamical back action, we entangled uh, microwaves and optics, and I uh, showed you a photonic readout. There are a lot of things to do now. We want to entangle qubits, build small networks. Uh, we want to improve uh, the control capabilities and, and study cavity uh, QED physics, or cavity e electro-optic physics. We have also a lot of qubit experiments, uh, interesting fabrication in our group. So if, if one of you is interested in these kind of things, uh, we, we like to work with flux cu type qubits with long flux on lifetimes in the hours uh, where we're developing gates for now. Um, if, you, if some of these things uh, look interesting to you, please talk to me. This is the rest of the group who I want to thank for all the hard work. Great. Thank you, uh, Johannes. Let's uh, do just a few questions, if anybody. Uh... Yes, Patrice. Sorry, Johannes, can, can you explain again how you manage to kill the, I mean, to, to kind of move or shift the, the other modes? Because uh, I missed that. Yeah, so there. There, there are the, the TE mode families where the electric field is uh, in, the, in the Z direction of the disk. But there are also the TM modes. And they have a slightly different FSR. And we have thousands of these modes. So we can, we can basic, and we don't care if you work at 1550 or 1550.001. So we, we basically scan where we have a situation where the TE, TM couple. And then we can either work on the left or on the right of that of that specific point. Great. Other questions? Uh, yes, up here. Uh, hi, Johannes. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. I noticed that when you analyze the data of this uh, microwave uh, photon conversion, you use the covariance matrix. and uh, how, how about G2? And I assume that uh, you are using Gaussian state approximation. And the second question is, how about non-Gaussian state? <clears throat> I'm not sure if I acoustically got it. Are you asking about G2 uh, measurements of the? Uh, yeah, first question is, uh, uh, how about the G2 in your measurement? Uh, sec yeah, G2. And second question is, uh, how about uh, non-Gaussian state? OK, the first one I think I got. So. Um, um, it's actually on our list. We would love to use the qubit as a single photon source, transduce, do optical G2 measurements. Um, you, need, uh, you need a sufficient amount of coincidence counts, and, and uh, we are in the process of developing the, the filtering techniques, technical things, and it would also help if, if the transducer is, uh, is improved again, uh, just to get the count rates we need to prove this. I, I'm not sure if, if this answered your question. And I didn't get the second one. I think that the second was about uh, non-Gaussian uh, states. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the main motivation to have the qubit there. We want to work with non-Gaussian states, for sure. Uh, can I add something? Because even if you are doing Gaussian state, you can, you, you, you can, use, you can measure, me measure G2 and to verify that that's actually a Gaussian state. Right here, you assume you use covariance matrix. You assume it's a perfect Gaussian state, right? Um, so, so as far as I, I mean, um, you, you're saying a G2 measurement would further corroborate our entanglement result. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah, we, I don't think this would have been possible with the statistics at hand and the measurement efficiency at hand. Uh, in the future, with better amplifiers and lower optical output losses, this might be possible. Good. I think we have to, to move on. So let's thank uh, Johannes again.
Uh, and for the next uh, speaker, who is uh, coming to the stage on the, the other side, we have uh, uh, Jonathan uh, Cohen from uh, Quantum Machines, who will uh, talk about the recent uh, developments that they have uh, done, uh, I think, on the correlation with uh, NVIDIA, uh, if that's correct. Uh, yes, good. Uh, so, Jonathan, take it away. Thank you. Um, um, okay, unlocking the potential of quantum classical processing. Uh, this is a topic that uh, at Quantum Machines we believe is very important uh, because we sort of see it as an important engine uh, towards uh, useful quantum computers. Um, and uh, in recent years, we're seeing more and more uh, the community going in this direction. Well, it's actually interesting if, if you go to quantum computing labs, uh, the students and the postdocs and the engineers, they, they know it for many years. They struggle with connecting quantum and classical devices. But uh, in recent years also, uh, the, the, the scientific community is really putting this as kind of like a highlight um, issue. Um, so today I want to tell you a little bit about what, uh, at least how do we define uh, what we call quantum classical processing and uh, tell you why we think it's important and, uh, and tell you a little bit about what we at Quantum Machines are doing uh, to push this forward. Okay, so how do we define quantum classical processing? So um, you need to perform some quantum operations in your quantum device, um, then um, take some measurements, do some quantum measurements, send the measurement signals uh, to your uh, classical device, then perform some classical processing, and then very importantly, uh, generate new quantum operations dependent on the classical processing uh, to generate new quantum operations and send them back to your quantum uh, device. <clears throat> so according to our definition, at least, you really have to kind of close this, this um, uh, entire uh, quantum classical loop uh, to fall under this definition. And interestingly, interestingly this, uh, fall, this actually kind of is compatible with some of the sort of uh, hottest topics in quantum computing today, like active state preparation, repeatancy success circuits, adaptive quantum error correction schemes, iterative phase estimations, calibration workflows, uh, accelerating calibrations, which is a very important um, fault tolerant quantum computing, of course, and, and variational algorithms. Um, so we kind of, you can kind of take these different use cases for this quantum classical uh, feedback loop and uh, try to categorize them according to the different requirements of the different use cases. Um, so we try to do that, and we um, find two interesting dimensions according to which you can categorize uh, these, these uh, requirements. The first one is what is the type of feedback that one wants to do, whether, for example, uh, you're just doing uh, conditional operations based on the classical processing, deciding whether you do a specific operation or not, uh, or whether you do full branching, what we call full control flow, uh, based on classical processing, or whether you up update parameters of the quantum operations based on the classical processing. So this is uh, one dimension. It has all, all kinds of small details around it. Uh, and the other interesting dimension uh, is, of course, the, uh, the feedback latency requirements. So we take the full classical feedback latency to be everything that happens on the classical side, from the moment where we sampled the last uh, measurement, uh, sample of the measurement signal, including the classical processing, the generation of uh, dependent quantum operations, and sending them uh, back to the quantum device. Um, and we um, identified three interesting categories of quantum classical uh, processing uh, based on the feedback latency requirements. The first is what we call quantum real-time. That's where we want the, uh, the feedback latency to be smaller significantly smaller than the, uh, than the qubit uh, coherence times and lifetimes. So uh, a typical example would be active qubit reset, where we measure the qubit, and if it's in the ground state, we don't do anything. But if it's in the excited state, we apply a pi pulse to ground it, uh, to put it in the ground state. And of course, we need the classical feedback to be shorter than the time the qubit changes its state, because otherwise, there's no reason to correct. So that's, that's quantum real time. Um, then we have system real time, which is uh, where we want the feedback latency to be much smaller than uh, the typical drifts in the system. So it turns out that if, you know, this is one of the major problems today with quantum computers, that parameters of the system drift. But if we can measure them fast enough and do this update of parameters based on the classical analysis of these signals, 
we can uh, correct for these system drifts. So one uh, nice example for this is shown here. Uh, you can see if you measure the qubit frequency as a function of time, it, it drifts, and then sometimes it, it jumps, uh, which is really bad if you're trying to build a large-scale quantum computer uh, with high fidelity and uh, uh, keep the high fidelities for a long time. But if you can do this quantum classical loop uh, fast enough, you can actually correct for these drifts. Um, so this is system real time. And the last category, it's slightly different. Here we don't strictly require the feedback latency to be shorter than something in order to succeed. But we want the feedback latency to be comparable or, or lower than the total uh, time of the quantum operations, just in order to not bottleneck the, the entire um, whatever it is that we're trying to run. Um, you know, this is unfortunately it's not the case in, uh, in many, many uh, quantum computers today. 99% of the time is being spent on communication with cl between classical devices, loading of programs, waveforms, things like that, compilation. And, uh, there is no real reason why this should be this. You know, we have amazing classical uh, compute technology. It's very scalable. We have uh, fast communication techniques, and uh, we want to shorten these classical times so the, the total runtime is dominated by the quantum operations. This is near quantum real time or, or near real time. So uh, if we want to read more about it, we recently uh, put a paper on archive. Um, where we kind of analyze these different use cases and requirements and give examples and categorize them and also um, propose benchmarks for how one would um, evaluate the classical control systems in these different types of, of categories. Um, okay. Um, so what, what do we do at Quantum Machines in order to, uh, to push um, on, these, on these capabilities? Um, so, the, the system that uh, is important for quantum classical integration is, is the control system. That's the classical interface to the QPU. And that's uh, kind of the heart of the quantum classical integration lies in the, in the control system. Um, and that's what we're developing in quantum machines. We developed a, a platform that we call the OPX platform. Um, and the core technology that we've developed is, is, is um, this uh, pulse processing unit, um, where basically the entire quantum uh, control program, but also the classical processing is running from a single, uh, from a single uh, processor. So this processor actually does four things. It generates pulses or signals that it sends to the QPU in a fully parametric way, so it can change the parameters of the, of the signals it sends to the, to the QPU on the fly. Um, it performs the uh, signal uh, processing on the measurement signals. And, but then we also integrated general classical compute engines into this, uh, this processor so that you can uh, do any kind of processing on, on, the, uh, on the input signals, on the, on the quantum measurements, and then update the parameters or do control flow or do conditional operations, as I mentioned. And all of that is done from the chip that is closest to the QPU so we can achieve the fastest latencies possible. And this is programmed with our uh, pulse level programming language that allows you to easily uh, uh, you know, write these quantum classical programs. So um, I wanted to give you just a few examples of, um, of um, this, this approach, this pulse processing approach, and what's the impact of it um, on different kinds of experiments, and relate it back to these different categories of quantum classical feedback. So the first example is an example for near real-time feedback. This is an example for, from uh, the group at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, where um, they, this, this is where you see that scanning the pass parameters simply on the fly from the pass processor really could reduce runtimes by orders of magnitude. So you can see this is a typical Ramsey measurement uh, that they used to perform in 900 minutes with a more uh, traditional control system. But because the pass processor can scan the parameters in real time, uh, this, this time drops uh, to two minutes. Actually, this is not just near real time. Uh, they also use active state preparation here to not wait for the qubits to decay to the ground state, but uh, actively prepare them, as we saw uh, earlier. And so this is a part of the speed up here is, is due to, uh, to this, actually. Um, so this is near, near real time. This is a nice example of, of system real time. This is uh, from the group of Professor uh, Andrew Zurak uh, in UNSW. This is a, a Rabi Chevron measurement on a, on a spin qubit, um, where, again, you see these speed ups due to the fast scanning of parameters. But what's going on here behind the scene is that also they take 
a certain number of shots of the actual experiment, and then they do a certain number of shots to actually retune the, uh, the sensor parameters uh, to, uh, to, to recalibrate it. So actually, I don't have this data here, but if you see the two figures with the feedback on and with the feedback off, it's not just about speed ups, it's also about cleaning up the data. This, this looks much cleaner because they keep stabilizing the, the device uh, very quickly here behind the scenes. This is system real time. Um, and this is uh, an, an, an example for quantum real time from um, Professor Oscar Painter's group in Caltech, where they do active state preparation of 10 qubits. So if you do multi qubit state preparation using active feedback, you can purify the state uh, much better than if you just wait for all the qubits to, to do, go to the, uh, the ground state. Um, by the way, I challenge you to think um, in these three categories, near real time, system real time, and quantum real time, where exactly quantum error correction uh, falls. Um, I, it's a non-trivial thing that I'm not sure, I'm not sure we have uh, a complete answer to yet. Um, this is another example for quantum real time. Um, where uh, we're very proud of, uh, because we collaborated on this with, with Google um, on their large, very large scale uh, Sycamore chip. So this is um, long-range quantum teleportation is a, a, um, a protocol that allows you to transmit quantum information from one side of a large chip, like, like the Sycamore chip, to the other side um, using, uh, using uh, real-time feedback and to do it more efficiently than just uh, using unitary operations. So if you use unit, you can do it using you know, swap operations. You just swap, 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 swap with all the nearest neighbors. <clears throat> but this is linear with the number of, this is linear with the size of the chain across you're trying to transmit the information. Turns out that with, <clears throat> with uh, classical feedback, you can, do, uh, you, can, you can be more efficient. So this is the typical uh, quantum teleportation protocol. Alice wants to send uh, her qubit to Bob. And uh, so they share an entangled pair, uh, bell pair, and then Alice entangles her qubit with her side of the bell pair. Then she um, takes some measurements and she, sh she sends classical information to, to, to Bob on the other side. Um, and he, by performing um, uh, conditional operations, can restore the qubit state on his side. So by sending uh, non-locally, sending uh, classical information, we can send quantum information. Um, Okay, so long-range quantum teleportation is very similar, but we're, we're trying to transmit the qubit across a chain of qubits. So we entangle all of the qubits in the chain, and then we perform measurements, and then it's, it's slightly more complicated. We're, we need to do this classical processing here to do these XOR operations between the even qubit measurements and the odd qubit measurements, uh, and then perform uh, conditional operations on the other side to retrieve the state. And as you can see here, this is the depth of the circuit doesn't scale with the number of qubits in the chain. Um, actually, um, IBM just released, um, I think, four, a few days ago, uh, an archive paper where they do exactly, they, they repeat this, but they also do it for much longer, uh, longer chains, I think all the way, almost to 100 qubits. Um, and so you can see that this, the, the depth of the circuit is, doesn't, doesn't scale with the number of qubits. <laughs> So we did this uh, with Google, um, with the Sycamore chip, and with our OPX. And uh, so you can start with state um, on one side of the chip, and then do, uh, if, you don't do if you don't do the feedback, if you, if you just do the measurements, the entanglement and the measurements, you don't do the feedback, you get a fully decohered state, of course. But then if you do the, uh, the feedback and conditional operations, you restore the uh, qubit state on the other side, which is you know quantum computing 101, but quite amazing uh, every time. Uh, you see it. Um, I think it really shows how much we made progress in really controlling quantum uh, quantum devices because you're really restoring information from relatively complicated uh, environment and retrieving a state of the, of the qubit. Um, yeah. So this is the kind of the power of the pulse processor. Um, but now we want to go uh, to the next steps. And we, I, I, uh, we basically set targets for two, two big next, next steps for us. One is to scale up the control systems for you know, up to 1,000 qubits and beyond. Um, and this requires, as we mentioned a couple of days ago, not just scaling up the system, but also improving the analog front end to be very specific to the control needs of quantum computers, um, because it, yeah, it, it won't help us to just build a 1,000 qubit computer. We have to push fidelities uh, to the limit uh, to make use of these qubits. And the other uh, sort of um, target 
uh, that once we scale, we believe that we will need much uh, higher compute power. Uh, so the, the, the processing power we have in the PAS processor uh, is not going to be enough. So on the uh, first uh, um, uh, front, we just launched two days ago our, our new flagship product, OPX 1000, um, which we're very excited to, to, to be launching it here in, the, in SQA. Um, and this, in addition to the pass processing approach and the pass level programming, it brings massive scale and uh, enhanced analog performance and also data center readiness. Um, so I don't know if I have a lot of time, but I, I, I do want to give you a little bit more details than, uh, on, this, on this product than uh, um, in the five minutes talk a, few, a couple of days ago. So the, the main, the main, uh, the main uh, unit is a three-unit rack uh, chassis that can host up to eight uh, what we call modular front-end modules. So uh, these are pluggable modules that you can plug in and out. Um, and the chassis itself also has dedicated FPGAs and processors for high-speed data transfer uh, between modules, between chassis, and also to an external server. Um, then this, this, uh, this product has um, hot swappable components like fans, power supplies, uh, etc., and single point of failure uh, redundancies so that, um, you know, if something, something in a scaled up system, if there's certain elements that can, can uh, you know, if they, if they fail, the entire system is down, so you have to put redundancies, and there's lots of automated self-tests and, and monitoring capabilities that we've added. Then the first module that we launched uh, here at SQA uh, has eight analog outputs at two giga sample per second and, two, and 750 megahertz bandwidth with uh, extremely low jitter and uh, also extreme uh, phase stability, so long-term long uh, phase stability, which is important, for example, for if you're doing uh, parametric gates um, uh, um, in superconducting qubits, so uh, this is something we put a lot of efforts on. Um, SFDR of above uh, 60 dBC up to 600 megahertz, am amplified voltage ranges and, and, and many more features. Um, and each one of these modules have our, our pulse processing units. So uh, actually 16 core, these pulse processors is a multi-core processor. For each channel, in fact, we have sort of a processor and its processors can talk to one another um, and share information. Then you can stack up many of these boxes together uh, uh, with extreme synchron synchronization. And the programming is done very seamlessly, like it's a single controller. Um, so you don't really care that you have many boxes. Um, and they, they share data between them. So they can distribute the, uh, the, the measurement results, uh, which is, again, very important for quantum classical processing, as we saw with the teleportation, for example. And that, of course, allows us to do feedback at scale and uh, multi-quantum machine, multi-user operations. Uh, users can slice these, these stack, these channels, uh, in different ways to control different parts of the QPU, do parallelization of, of calibrations and uh, things of that nature. <clears throat> okay, um, lastly, you know, once we scale up the system, as I said, we, we also want to connect it to much higher processing power. Um, so about uh, two years ago, we met with the NVIDIA quantum team and we, uh, we reconnected around this uh, vision of connecting uh, the control system to high performance compute resources. And several months ago, we, we announced uh, that we're developing a product together that we call DGX Quantum. It's going to connect uh, the, basically a very low latency interface between the uh, controller, the OPX, and the NVIDIA Gracehopper platform, the GPUs. Um, so, we're going to connect it on the hardware, but also on the very uh, low-level software so that we can write data from the controller directly to the GPU memory and achieve latencies. We're targeting latencies of sending measurement data from the OPX to the uh, GPU and back in about five, five microseconds. And we're also going to integrate it to our uh, software interfaces, of course, in the form of these function calls. So, in, in our past level programming language, you can do this classical processing and do this, uh, all these quantum classical programs. Now you can also call functions that you wrote on the GPU, uh, send the data and get the data back from the GPU and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and use it in your quantum control program. We're also going to integrate it to CUDA Quantum, which is the higher kind of gate level language uh, by, by NVIDIA, so that at the end of the day, uh, and users of quantum computers will be able to write hybrid quantum classical programs at high level. 
All right, so I hope I was able to uh, convince you that quantum classical processing is a really cool uh, subject and really important uh, for our field. And uh, yeah, I'll be happy to take any questions. Great. Uh, and we have time for just uh, maybe one or two questions. There was one uh, here. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a question about the quantum teleportation uh, part, the long-range teleportation. So uh, would you require a dedicated bus of qubits to do this sort of a transportation? Because typically in swap operations, you use the qubits which are part of the processor, whereas here you need to put all of them in some sort of an entangled state. So, uh, okay, so this is about the require all of the qubits in between to be in some sort of an entangled state. Yes. So would you require like a dedicated bus of qubits to do these kind of operations or? Yeah, okay, so. Um, yeah. So, so the question for everybody, yes. uh, do you require a special bus to prepare the entangled states of all the qubits? Uh, yeah, so, for, okay, so it, it really depends what you're trying to do um, with this teleportation. Whether it's, you know, at the beginning of the algorithm, maybe you're just trying to create some uh, long-range long, long range, uh, uh, entanglement, and then you start your algorithm, and then you reset all the qubits uh, in between, or whether you do it in the middle of, the, uh, of an algorithm. So it's really kind of a subroutine, and it really depends what, what it is used for, right? Um, one of the things we're looking at is whether you can do these kind of teleportations via the ancillas uh, while you're doing quantum error correction. So that's, that's one of the interesting things that, that could be done here. Um, and it turns out that there's nice protocols um, that we're looking at that allow you to do the potential via the ancillas while you're still doing quantum error correction. So that's, that's I think, super interesting. Yeah. Great. Then let's thank uh, Jonathan again. Thank you. And in the, the next uh, presentation, we will have uh, Tom Stace uh, to talk about uh, Circulator, uh, specifically circulators that are uh, on chip. Uh, so, as especially the experimentalists in the room know, uh, circulators are big and bulky. So, if they could be uh, small and, and nice to use, that would be great. And uh, Tom will tell us about the latest uh, research he's doing in that direction. Thanks very much. Um, Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming along, and thanks for the organisers for putting this, this meeting together. It's, re it's really great. Uh, I've come from Brisbane, Australia. Uh, I'm at a university there, uh, but I'm here to talk about some work that began in my academic uh, career. Um, but we, my co-founder, Arkady Fedorov, who's one of the scientific advisors for this uh, conference, uh, and I decided to, f to found a company last year. Seems like in quantum, if you haven't got a a startup you're not trying these days. Uh, we founded this, this company called Analog Quantum Circuits uh, last year, and the, the mission of Analog Quantum Circuits is to develop um, uh, superconducting circulators uh, for, for quantum computing. And so I want to give a little bit of context for, does that work? Uh, for, uh, for where quantum computing is going, but this is a, a, a slightly old roadmap that, that IBM published a few years ago. Uh, starting in 2019, they had these, these early generations of, of devices, and last year they published this one, and I guess we'll see something about uh, the 1,000 qubit device. This year we saw Google has a, a similar roadmap. Um, IBM's recently said they want to get to about 100,000 qubits in a decade, and, and that's extremely ambitious and will be a uh, useful uh, device that they, they are aiming for. But to give you a, an idea of the complexity of, of that when you get down to the, the hardware level, this is a photo of a, of a fridge. I think this one came from ETH. At the start of that roadmap, 2019, um, coincident with that, that start of that roadmap. And this device has four qubits sitting at the bottom of the fridge. And it also has this chain of, of uh, signaling uh, control that goes from the, the bottom of the fridge to the top. Uh, it has uh, qubits at the bottom, circulators, amplifiers, and so on. And there's a scaling law. There's four qubits. And there's four of these additional devices that are needed to, to talk to those qubits, both to send signals and to read out from those devices. 
And so there's a problem, which is the scaling of the number of components required to address qubits. And that, that problem is known uh, in classical electronics as Rent's rule. It tells you how many uh, connections, external connections, you need to address the components at the bottom of the fridge. And quantum systems have an extreme version of that, which is that there's roughly a proportional scaling between the number of qubits and the number of uh, connectors that you need to address those qubits and, and control them. So, Analog quantum circuits is focused on one particular bit of that chain at the moment. It's uh, the circulators. Circulators are things that uh, experimentalists mostly think of as extremely mundane components. Uh, some theorists who know about them think they're great uh, because they've got some interesting physics. But conventional commercial circulators are uh, uh, macroscopic objects. I've shown a coin here. This is an Australian coin, a 20 cent coin, not to indicate the price of those devices. They're actually about $2,000, but to indicate their scale. So there's the size of a matchbox or a coin, and if you open one up, uh, you can see they've got quite a lot of components, they're mechanical elements, uh, and they're sort of hand-built. And that's fine for a few qubits, maybe a few dozen qubits, maybe you know, even a few hundred qubits if you have enough money, but you can see there's a problem fitting uh, those elements into a, a fridge with limited space and, uh, and uh, even wiring that, uh, that system up. Uh, and so I started thinking about this problem with uh, Clemens Muller, who was my postdoc uh, in about 2016, uh, and Jared Cole, who we heard from yesterday, uh, about how would you solve that scaling problem? That is, how would you put those circulators, which are currently macroscopic elements with large ferrite cores, on a chip uh, right at the bottom of the fridge on the same substrate, fabricated and integrated with the rest of the, 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 the qubits that one's trying to make? And we read this paper by Jens Koch from 2010, and he explained how to do that. He was thinking about how to make a, a non-reciprocal uh, analog quantum simulators, but the, the core element of that was, in fact, a circulator. And it consists of a loop of, of three Josephson junctions threaded by a magnetic flux, coupled to some external waveguides. Uh, and if you analyze this, this device electronically, uh, there's regimes in which it behaves like a circulator. Uh, and so a few years ago, we made an early prototype version of this. This is a, a, a device with three metallic islands, three Josephson junctions, replicating this, this element here. Uh, and we measured that device and uh, showed a proof of principle that it, it behaves as we expected for, uh, for this, this electronic circuit. Now, if you, if you look at that, that circuit and squint a little bit, it's got sort of three ports. It's got a flux. It's got some capacitors. It looks a little bit like a, a flux capacitor. Um, this is a famous photo from a, a, a Hollywood movie, um, Back to the Future, and, and it got picked up, the theory that we did uh, a few years ago now, five years ago, got picked up by the popular media saying that we'd invented a real-life uh, flux capacitor. Uh, you know, the, the flux capacitor we invented doesn't take you back to the future, uh, but it does break time reversal symmetry, which is a, a necessary component of microwave circulators in general. Uh, and that's why theorists like it, because it has this, this interesting physics that breaks uh, time reversal symmetry. And indeed, that's why I, I was first interested in thinking about them. But uh, back to a uh, serious land of, of, uh, of theoretical physics and, and, uh, and experiments. This is the device just in, in the bottom here. If you simulate the, the electronics of that, the quantum mechanics of that device, it's fairly straightforward. You can calculate the, the spectrum. Uh, there's a few parameters that matter. There's charge biases, there's flux biases. Um, but as, as a function of those externally applied parameters, for example, the flux bias, one can, can compute the spectrum, the, the energy eigenstates of that problem, and that's illustrated in this picture as these uh, dotted lines. So the dotted lines are just the, the spectrum of, of that circuit. So we can calculate that. We know how to do it. Uh, it's, 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 it's not too difficult. Um, su superimposed on this plot, uh, is a color scale which indicates the performance of that device as a circulator, in this case a circulator uh, propagating in the, in the uh, clockwise direction. So what does that mean? Well, a circulator is a device, for those who uh, are not experimentalists, it's a device that takes a signal from one port, uh, let's say port, uh, port one, and sends it through to port two, but not to port three. Simultaneously, a signal coming in port two will propagate to port three, but not port one, and a signal coming in from port three goes to port one, but not port two. So it's a non-reciprocal element that, that moves signals around. If you've been to uh, the UK, you'll be familiar with roundabouts, uh, things that distribute vehicles around uh, 
in circles, it sort of behaves a little bit like that, but for, for microwaves. Um, now, this is a device that, that has a sort of a, a handedness. It, it sends signals one way, uh, but not the other. And so you can define a, a performance metric of fidelity as to how well uh, such a device is behaving. And so superimposed on this spectrum, you can see these, this color map. And where the color map is red, that indicates that this device is circulating strongly in a particular direction. And so that's theory. We, uh, we showed that, in principle, if you could make this device with high enough precision, uh, you can find regions in this parameter space where it circulates uh, very nicely. Um, and so that, that was the basis for us wanting to, to, to build a device and test it. Uh, and I showed you that, uh, that um, experimental uh, device that we built a few years ago. What I'm going to show you now is, is much more uh, up-to-date uh, results that we put on the archive just uh, earlier this week. So in this, in this spectrum, you can see various features. So there's a, a doublet of lines that, that uh, at very low flux or, very, or, or uh, at 2 pi uh, is degenerate, but it splits. And where this, this, uh, this sort of quasi-degenerate doublet uh, just about meets up is the, the point where the device uh, is expected to circulate um, very well. So if you look at that, it sort of has a characteristic V-shaped structure or Y-shaped structure. And so we've measured that in, uh, in recent devices, and this is a plot of that spectrum. Now, the other thing you'll see here is that there's uh, one, two, three, four at any given flux bias. You can see uh, four different lines. And so in the experiment, you can see crudely, yes, indeed, at some flux point, there's one, two, three, and then there's some, some hidden up here. But they're also on this uh, spectral uh, plot, this data. You can see there's, there's sort of multiplets of lines uh, grouped up together. And if you look in very closely, you can see multiplets of lines uh, in here. We've done the, 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 the modeling for that, that specific uh, device that we, we made. And so I've superimposed on the same data set uh, the, the, the spectral data. I've superimposed the lines predicted by the theory. And you can see the colorful lines obscure uh, the data, meaning that it ex explains the data e extremely well. Now, the theory I showed you before just had a single uh, transition at, say, this frequency, a single one at this point, a single one at this point, and a single one up here. What are these multiplets? Well, those multiplets are coming uh, uh, from the fact that there are quasi-particles jumping around in this device. And so there's an additional process which we can model, which is uh, the, the process in which a Cooper pair on, say, this island splits, and one part of the Cooper pair, one of the quasi-particles, hops onto this island. Now, if you think about it, there's, there's, uh, if there's a neutral configuration in which there's no quasi-particles on the islands, there's then th three additional states in which there's uh, an odd number of quasi-particles on two of the islands and an even number on the, uh, the last island, and there's three ways to, to do that. So there's really a total of four quasi-particle states, one neutral state plus three uh, non-trivial states. And so if you measure the, the, the circulation of this device or the spectrum from this device as a function of, uh, of time, you see uh, some characteristic hopping uh, events and so this is measuring one of the scattering matrix elements, S, S2, 3, from uh, port 2 to 3, as a function of time, as a function of sample numbers. These samples are about one millisecond long. And you can see, if you zoom in on this, on this uh, time series, you can see uh, the system groups around different, uh, different levels. Now, we take that, that data, we run it through a hidden Markov um, classification process, and we find that, uh, indeed, in the experimental data, there are uh, four states, four hidden states that explain the data very well. So we can then uh, separate those, uh, those four, four states that the system explores as a function of time and, and do that then as a function of external parameters like the flux uh, and, and also the frequency. And from that classified data, we get uh, plots like this. So this is a representation of the S matrix, the scattering matrix, which is a three by three matrix as a function of, of frequency. And you can see that in the data that, that was classified in one particular uh, of these four quasi-particle sectors, you can see these blue curves uh, have uh, a very strong asymmetry uh, with respect to inversion of this, this matrix. So you can see that the scattering matrix element S12 is quite high at this point. That's indicated by this blue bar. S21 is low. Likewise, S23 is high. S32 is low. S31 is high. S13 is low. 
and you can see there's some residual reflectivity uh, on the diagonal here. So that's in one of these quasi-particle sectors, as we call them. And uh, if you look at one of the other quasi-particle sectors, you can see, in fact, that this S matrix spectrum is quite symmetric. So these two are similar. Uh, these these uh, external diagonal ones are similar. These are similar, and the diagonals uh, is as it is. And so you can see just from this classified data that one of these quasi-particle sectors circulates quite well. It's uh, got a strongly non-reciprocal scattering matrix. Uh, and the other one, one of the other ones, has a very symmetric scattering matrix. And that's true for the other two that I haven't shown. The, sort of the, the scattering matrices associated with the red and the orange uh, classified data. Um, so how do, you, how do you distill that into slightly more uh, uh, absorbable uh, form? Well, we define a, a performance metric, which we call a fidelity. And the fidelity is the average of the off-diagonal elements that one wants to be high in circulation. Uh, and it, you can think of it as a, as a trace of the measured scattering matrix with, with respect to the ideal case. It's a performance metric that goes to one for an ideal uh, circulator, and it's less than one for a non-ideal circulator. And you can see in this, uh, in this uh, distilled data, as a function of frequency, this sector one, as we've called it, which is the, the, the sector with no quasi-particles, uh, is reaching a, a fidelity that's quite high, 80%, and the other ones are saturated at about um, 50%. Now, on this data, which, which is used to calculate those fidelities, I've also superimposed theory curves, that's the solid line sitting on top of the, the light-coloured lines, and that theory is what's used to calculate the, this, uh, this modelled uh, response as well. And you can see we have a relatively good understanding uh, of a match between the theory and the experiment, which gives us some confidence that the, uh, the device is behaving uh, as we expect. And in particular, we understand why this number is 80% and not 90% or uh, 95%. Uh, and so we have some idea of how to proceed to make, make it better. Uh, for the experimentalists, you think in terms of uh, decibels, uh, here's the power response as a function of frequency. Um, the reflectance should be low at, uh, at the operating point, uh, and the insertion loss should be, should be high. There's a, a, a peak insertion loss of about 2 dB at this point, uh, and at that same point, there's an isolation of about um, 14 dB, and you can measure a 3 dB uh, bandwidth of about 200 megahertz. So that gives you some idea of the performance characteristics of the circulator that we've made and measured and put onto the archive uh, earlier this week. And so I'll, I've, I've pretty much run out of time, but I'll, I'll uh, just give you a little vision as to where uh, analog quantum circuits sees its role in the wider ecosystem of uh, quantum computing development. If you think back to the 1950s, 40s and 50s, early digital computers looked like this thing here, and you can see some engineers plugging in cables. Uh, but modern computers don't look anything like that. They look like this. Uh, the, the chips integrate all of the complexity of this thing onto a single uh, unit. Now, quantum computers are beautiful, but they sort of are reminiscent of this story here. And so to make uh, useful quantum computers with thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of, of qubits, uh, AQC's thesis is that uh, fabrication and in integration are going to be critical. And we saw that, um, we saw that yesterday with Donna's talk, that uh, the great work that's going uh, in, into the, the fabrication uh, and, and integration, but that also requires that the components that are part of that story, including circulators, need to be shrunk, and so, so that's what we're doing. So um, I'll finish there. One, one little shout out to, to Dat, where's Dat? Dat's in the audience here. Here's a poster uh, talking about his um, PhD work, which was on a um, on completely different uh, 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 topic. It was on the, the subject of um, non-compactness comp or compactness of the superconducting phase. If you're interested in that question, then go and have a chat to Dat uh, in, the, in the poster session. Um, but I'll, um, I'll finish there. Thanks very much. Um. Great. Uh, thank you, Tom. We have a question from uh, Will. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, enjoyed the talk. Um, do you have any um, prospects for increasing the bandwidth, and what does that look like? Uh, yeah, we do. So, I mean, I guess th that depends on... So, so, yes, we have some ideas for how to do that. Uh, I won't go into them in, at the, in, in this talk, but I'll, I'm happy to talk to you to afterwards. Uh, but I guess what I would say is that the footprint of these things is... Uh, I mean, to, uh, 
a preview as to the answer is that the footprint of these things is about a million times smaller than conventional circulators. So essentially you can use a multiple of them if, if you want to. That's, that's one approach to increasing the bandwidth. There are, there are others too, but happy to talk after. Great, uh, we have a question over there. So can you um, say uh, how, I, I, I guess this uh, say quasi-particle poisoning and uh, is, is, is still an issue for your device? Uh, Sorry, I, I yeah, qu Quasi-particle poisoning is an issue for your oh. device, and so can you comment uh, on the, say, the perspective to, to solve a bit the, the, the... Yeah, so I think I understand the question. Is, is quasi-particle poisoning a problem? Um, y yes, clearly it is. This is a device that, that works as a circulator about one quarter of the time, and then for about 40 or 50 milliseconds. That's not very long. Uh, we, have, we have approaches to dealing with that, and so we're working on those, but they're sort of part of the company's activity, and hopefully next year we'll be able to report uh, success in that, that front. I guess I would say that this, this has less constraints than, than qubits do for operating uh, in its desired uh, regime, because we don't care about decoherence as much as we care about uh, operating uh, in a, near the ground state. Great, maybe we can have uh, one last question. Is one at the back? Uh, thank you for your talk. If I'm not mistaken, you have capacitive coupling between circulator and transmission lines. So you have charging islands. Do you, is it how sensitive to charge noise? Well, in a sense, the fact that it, it sees quasi-particle poisoning is indicative that it's extremely sensitive to, to charge noise. Uh, but quasi-particle hopping is a, is a large perturbation to the system. Uh, it's relatively insensitive to, to um, per perturbative charge noise, um, and, and we see quite stable spectra over uh, hours. Thank you. Great. Then let's thank uh, Tom again. Great, and the last uh, talk in this uh, session is from uh, Matt uh, Tolan from uh, uh, KTH and from uh, Intermodulation Product, I think. Uh, and uh, he will talk about uh, doing two qubit gates with uh, direct digital synthesis. Take it away. Hello, uh, can you hear me well? I'm not really used to talking to microphones like this. Uh, my name is Mats Tolian. I'm an industrial PhD student with intermodulation products uh, in the group of David Haviland at Nanostructure Physics at KTH in Stockholm, uh, Sweden. Um, as an industrial uh, PhD, I have uh, two goals. Uh, one is about an instrumentation and measurement platform. And the other is about the more scientific part, is about readout and control of superconducting qubits. And like the title indicates, I have been doing characterization and benchmarking of a phase sensitive two qubit gate uh, using an instrument called Presto that has been a very big part of my PhD. Uh, the setup used in the experiment is pretty standard, but except for filters, attenuators, bias T's, amplifiers, and circulators. Presto is the only instrument connected to the DR, and it's responsible for all aspects of control and measurement in this setup. The sample measured in the bottom here uh, is a two-qubit sample from the Department of Microtechnology and Nanoscience at Chalmers. And especially note that there are no analog mixers in this setup. Uh, there are none outside the Presto, and there are none inside the Presto unit. The phase-sensitive gate characterized the benchmark is the ISWAP gate. Uh, it's commonly represented with, uh, whoa, sorry, this circuit uh, symbol. Uh, and on the right, you can see the matrix representation of the gate, uh, where you can see that the gate has no effect when both qubits are in ground or both are in excited. Uh, but if one is in ground and one is in excited, the energy is swapped, uh, and the qubit receiving the energy does so with a pi over two phase shift. And in the sample used, uh, the two qubits are connected uh, by a tunable parametric coupler whose squid is inductively coupled to a waveguide. 
allowing DC and AC modulation of the coupled frequency. And on the equation on the top, we have uh, the system Hamiltonian without any control applied. But when we apply a flux uh, consisting of a DC and an AC part, like this, uh, the effective Hamiltonian becomes the expression below. Uh, when we have a proper, properly selected DC bias uh, and the coupler is driven at the difference frequency of the qubits. Uh, that Hamiltonian will in turn implement this unitary. And for the purpose of this presentation, we just accept this and note that for this to become an eye swap, we have to tune the magnitude, the duration, and the phase of the coupler drive. So, to find how the coupler frequency depend on voltage, I made two measurements. On the left, uh, there is a res uh, resonator spectroscopy for different bias voltages. And on the right, I have two-tone qubit spectroscopy, also for different bias voltages. And from these measurements, they avoided level crossings, uh, the lines extending out to the sides. Um, uh, indicates uh, w when the coupler freq frequency coincides with the qubits and the readout resonator's frequencies. So based on this, I selected a bias voltage of 3.775 volts, or it's equivalent to about 0 0.25 flux quantum, which uh, parks the, resonate, uh, the coupler in the middle between the uh, lowest frequency readout resonator and the highest frequency qubit. So yeah, parking as far away from the other components as possible. Uh, to select the drive amplitude, I did a frequency and amplitude sweep uh, with a fixed pulse length, which you can see on the left. Uh, from this image, I picked uh, an operating point and amplitude uh, before it starts looking chaotic and becoming too sensitive to amplitude. And I used this uh, amplitude uh, doing, which you can see on the right, a, a, a pulse duration and frequency sleep sweep uh, to find the settings for maximum exchange of energy between the two qubits. In both of these measurements, uh, qubits 1 and qubits 2 are measured simultaneously with uh, multiplexed readout. And so far, so good. Uh, energy is clearly being swapped between the qubits. But if I now test this gate by preparing the qubits in some states, uh, apply the gate and do a tomography on the, on the qubits afterwards, we can see that the ground ground, uh, if I prepare ground ground, uh, the final state remains in ground ground. If I prepare ground excited, it does indeed swap. But for the other state, uh, where one qubit is prepared on the equator, uh, it looks like the one on the equator is swapped down like it should, but the other one is just lost to the center of the block sphere. So, if we have another look at the unitary operation, we see that it includes eta, which is the relative phase between the modulation pulse of the tunable coupler and the phase difference of the frames rotating at the qubit's frequencies. Yeah. So, in this first attempt uh, to apply the gate, the qubits and the coupler phases were free running, and which resulted in a different relative phase every time the eye swap is repeated, and after averaging, the information is washed away. So in the excellent work done in Stefan Philipp's group, published in 2020, which has been the main publication I used as a reference throughout my work, uh, they added a homemade frequency and phase synchronization unit and a trigger unit to take control of the, over the phase. Uh, with Presto, on the other hand, uh, all synchronization is built into the unit, uh, and it can all, all this can be achieved with just a few lines of source code uh, to synchronize and set proper phases for the gates. So how does this work? Yeah. In this figure, you can see a simplified version of the signal generation logic uh, for the channels used in this setup. It's a very simplified version, but I think it serves its purpose. 
So using templates, so right, templates uh, which are uh, essentially arbitrary waveform generators, uh, and uh, IF frequency carriers. Uh, we generate a signal at one giga samples per second, which is then uh, inter interpolated to 10 giga samples per second, which indicated by this color shift here. So we, have, we enter the 10 giga sample per second sample domain. Uh, in this domain, uh, the signal is mixed with a numeric oscillator, so still in the digital domain. And finally, at the end, it's converted to an analog signal. And using the second and sometimes even the third Nyquist zone, this will uh, allow us to cover the entire 4 to 8 gigahertz band commonly used with superconducting qubits. So what is not shown in this picture is the fairly <laughs> complicated uh, infrastructure for interpolating the signals properly from 1 to 10 giga samples. We also not shown is uh, clock and DAC synchronization. Uh, so the, 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 the high performance PLLs in the system, uh, a few of them show up here, but there's actually one for each of the uh, DACs. Uh, um, and all this infrastructure is a part of the RFSOC platform that our instrument is built on, and we just harness this power uh, to achieve this, our end goal. And the one giga sample per second uh, bandwidth is a choice that we made. It's a trade-off between uh, bandwidth at, and uh, resource efficiency. So when we actually run the pulse sequence, we start by synchronizing all the NCOs and start the pulse sequence using the same source signal, uh, which ensures a repeatable phase relation between all generated signals. So that is the uh, <laughs> SysRef signal accompanying the clock signal, which allows for this uh, phase synchronization. Unfortunately, resynchronizing the NCOs uh, in the high frequency clock, yeah, 10 gigas, gigahertz is a very high clock frequency for digital electronics. So synchronizing the NCOs in this clock domain uh, requires preloading phase values, rearming synchronization, and then issuing the SysRef signal uh, to actually uh, resynchronize the NCOs. And this is too slow uh, to do within the measurement sequence. So instead, we control the phase of the signals in the one giga sample per second domain, which runs at 500 megahertz. And while 500 megahertz is still quite high clock frequency, it's low enough uh, for us uh, to, to enable uh, synchronous uh, switching of the phase of any signal generated in the system. Uh, so we, we can basically change the signal of, of our gener uh, change the phase of our generated carrier at any two nanosecond interval based on this 500 megahertz clock frequency. Uh, on top of this, we also use a trick. Uh, once we generate a full sequence uh, of pulses at the IF, uh, in the IF clock domain, sometimes you want to repeat it, uh, and you want to repeat it quickly. Uh, and to avoid uh, having to change the phase in, in the uh, generated signal in the IF clock domain, uh, we tune the NCOs to the repetition rate of the experiment, such that the phase of the NCOs uh, will always uh, start at the same phase at the be beginning of each measurement sequence. And then to actually uh, target our uh, frequencies, uh, since this puts a, a constraint on the NCO frequency, we put the remaining frequency in the IF carrier, so we don't just control phase, but also the frequency using the IF carrier. And this is just a trick uh, to, for example, do averaging uh, in a simple way. So what are the, why bother with EDS? Uh, the obvious reasons are, uh, since we have no mixers, we have no LO leakage. Uh, since we have no analog mixers, we also have no uh, need to do mixer calibration. And when it comes to scaling, uh, this two-unit instrument uh, actually provides 16 output channels uh, covering uh, the, the entire 4 to 8 gigahertz band directly. Uh, and on top of this, we also have a 
way too large number of inputs, a few high frequency continuous wave signals, uh, 16 analog uh, DC signals, biasing signals, and a few digital trigger inputs and outputs. So when it comes to scaling, I would say it's uh, not only uh, space efficient, but uh, we also reduce the complexity. We have, need fewer units due to the high number of direct RF signals. Uh, and we need fewer cables in the setup, uh, which allows for sim more simple troubleshooting. <laughs> so one con might be the phase noise. It seems to be harder to keep the phase noise down when running converters at high clock frequency in this, than at low frequencies. And during up conversion, uh, signal synthesized at lower frequency don't as much pay the price since the uh, up, analog up conversion process doesn't add that much no, uh, phase noise to the signal. So let's take a look at the phase noise of Presto. Uh, yeah, so we, we have measured the phase noise of Presto at different carrier frequencies and different offsets from the carrier. And this, the, the, this figure doesn't say very much to me. So we tried to apply uh, the role of the master clock stability in quantum information processing. Uh, which indicates that if we do a primitive pi pulse of 20 nanoseconds, uh, we get an error floor of 3.2 to the minus 7 uh, at 4 gigahertz, 2.3 to minus 6 at 8 gigahertz, uh, which I think is pretty low, <laughs> a low error floor. Uh, so phase noise from this point of view is still for a long time not an issue. Uh, these errors are equivalent to having qubits with T1s of 30 mil milliseconds and 5 milliseconds, respectively, uh, for this pulse, based on the universal fidelity, fidelity reduction of quantum operations. So, now that the phase of the coupler is under control, we are able to measure the average tomography for the final state. The information is no longer washed away by averaging. And we can still see that the phase shift is not pi over 2. So to tune the phases, uh, I simply selected a couple of reference states, applied the gate, and tuned the phase of the uh, coupler drive until I got the expected result. Uh, how many minutes? Ah, I will skip the diversive shift then. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, I... Uh, to verify that the gate actually was an iSwap, I ran interleaved randomized benchmarking with sequences generated by Qiskit. Uh, it's 10 different lengths in the range 1 to 30 Cliffords and 200 realizations for each sequence length. And the resulting error for the interleaved gate is 2.0%, ah, oh, sorry, uh, or 1.9%, depending on if I measure qubit 1 or qubit 2, which is actually pretty similar, similar to the paper I used as the main reference for this experiment. And finally, the conclusion is that it works. Uh, the infrastructure is there, and the IPI is available to perform experiments with control relative uh, microwave phases. Unfortunately, I ran out of time with the sample before I could identify the main contributing source of the gate error. But fortunately, more work on this topic is, with this instrument is in progress, and uh, I hope the result to be presented at future conferences. Uh, so with that, I thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any question if there is time. Great. Thank you, uh, Matt. Let's have a few uh, questions. We have a question over there. Hi. Thank you. Um, so at the end, we need to measure um, the, the actual phase drift. So um, two questions. One, can you comment on what is the like phase drift per degree Celsius or per hour that the controller gives. And second, um, th th you show the, the diagram where you, you, you use PLLs to, to up-convert the, the clock frequency. Um, and you use the same PLL for the three qubits, which is, which is okay, because then, um, th then all qubits sit on the same PLL. But once you scale up, you will have qubits that sit on different PLLs, and PLLs tend to drift, phase drift, uh, cause phase drift between channels. So, can you comment on the actual phase drifts between channels that sit in different boxes, for example, or on different PLLs? Unfortunately, I cannot comment on the relative phase drift between channels. Uh, what I can say is that my interleaved randomized benchmarking 
uh, did run over hours, several hours, uh, with the people in the lab, no people in the lab, uh, yeah. So uh, exposed to uh, fluctuations probably due to uh, shifting environments uh, and also from time passing by. Uh, but uh, we have no metrics uh, uh, for long-term drifts between channels yet. Okay, any other questions? Uh, otherwise, I, I would be, be interested to ask, uh, so since you connect also the channel to your flux line, yeah. Okay, since you connect your channel to your uh, uh, flux line, are you worried about uh, low frequency noise causing, let's say, defacing noise on your uh, flux line? What I do know is that I ended up with a 98% uh, fidelity. Uh, the gate is supposed to be coherence limited at 99.2 or 3%. Uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I have had no time to uh, do the error budgeting. So uh, I have 1.2 approximately percent of error that I do not know where it's from. Uh, so I hope uh, this answer will come in the near future uh, because very similar measurements are ongoing using the same experiments, okay. uh, the same instrument. Okay, great. Okay, with that, then uh, let's thank uh, Mats again. <laughs> and uh, before you go and drink coffee, Stefan will uh, say a few words. Uh, Good news, we will have a longer coffee break now, so that means we have 40 minutes for coffee, which is equivalent to, well, 11.25, where we will we'll, uh, continue with the session in here, which will be a shorter session due to illness. Um, we will have the coffee break now downstairs, uh, so there is the food to the coffee. Um, and there was something else I, need to, <laughs> I needed to say, um, which is that Exactly. If you uh, didn't pick up your poster from yesterday, you can pick that up now. They have been taken off, but you can still gather them um, downstairs, I think. And the poster session will be today also on the ground floor. So please, again, as yesterday, find a suitable spot for your poster and uh, be there at like 1.30. Thank you for that. Enjoy the coffee break. See you at 11.25 also for the live stream.
do we have Torsten already? Yes. Hello? Yes. To there? To the stage? Okay. So, good morning to everyone and welcome to the last session of the morning. It's my pleasure to be the chair of this session that will be on benchmarking and enabling software. My name is Ines de Vega. I'm the head of the quantum innovation department uh, here in Munich, is mainly where we are located. And our first speaker today is Torsten Last, who is the director of development and engineering in Orange uh, Quantum Systems and he will be describing novel approaches in QPU manufacturing and testing. And I'm very much looking forward for this talk. So thank you very much. And Torsten, the stage is George. Thank you for this nice introduction, Ines. Um, and uh, real. <laughs> Um, header of this talk is Ingredients for Developing uh, Superconducting Quantum Processes at Scale. And um, it's a little bit also a more high-level presentation. Um, the, the name of this conference is actually quite, quite neat, uh, Qubits and Algorithms. And that's because <coughs> the computational ecosystems here made tremendous progress in combining classical supercomputers and um, quantum computers in these um, labs. And um, that's also because, they're because of the first movers in the quantum hardware sphere who made actually tremendous progress in um, increasing the qubit count of a quantum processor and its um, performance. Um, this can also be seen here on this large plot. Uh, where the qubit number is um, plotted against the qubit error rates of the system. But um, I think it's now common agreement in this community that for a quantum advantage, many more and actually even better qubits are even needed. And uh, although this is a scientific conference, I think everybody is also looking a little bit uh, towards industry and uh, commercialization, um, and I think it's also hopefully common agreement, or I will hear later <laughs> after the end of this talk, um, that uh, this task of scaling the qubit count and even reducing the error rates cannot be achieved by scientific breakthroughs alone, but uh, you require also different aspects of the ecosystem, novel approaches, and maybe um, even new products which are not even pro currently developed. Uh, to be very concrete, what already was mentioned, is I want to uh, stress or bring home uh, to this community that probably we need also to think about new approaches in fabrication and testing of these quantum devices. <coughs> because we think uh, that as we approach it currently, they are not scalable, and actually already slowing down this rapid progress in this field. Um, we think that uh, novel approaches could be to, to re-accelerate this uh, learning curve and even scale up quantum processors to larger scales, is um, that novel approaches, when I mean by manufacturing, that we have to come closer to foundry-compatible processes. And um, at the end of the day, when the foundry is up and running, then the output is much larger, then also you need a different test infrastructure. Um, of course, when it also kind of results the foundry compatibility, this will also hopefully lead to um, much more ma maximized device yield and uh, minimized device variability. And uh, what I mean by novel test architecture or structure is I think we have to also revision our way of thinking about metrology, inspection, and actually testing at the end of the day. So that um, might also need new novel products and um, better interface definition within the technology chain. Um, with this, this is pretty much the outline of my talk. And um, 
I was thinking about uh, how to approach this, since this is also a very scientific group of people still. So what I'm, I was proposing here in this presentation is the first one is a glimpse how um, an emerging quantum industry th should think. But the largest portion of this presentation will be actually something like for, for newly started PhD students, postdocs, or assistant professors who are kind of getting just started. And I give you an idea how we could actually, in this ecosystem, also can think of how to accelerate learnings. Uh, so this kind of high-level ingredient, which I was talking about, about foundry compatibility, is, uh, for instance, starting with inline inspections or inspection in itself, is I think we have to be much more severe in process control and have to bring in on a daily basis uh, solutions like cross TEM systems or um, energy dispersion <coughs> um, spectroscopy. This is just um, two examples which are used by our partners at IMEC very regularly to analyze the, the individual components, and I'm not sure how much it is already distributed in shared facilities or in small clean rooms. Um, but these kind of ideas then will also lead to a much better learning of these quantum devices and then also much tighter process control. And actually the most interesting part of this slide is that IMEC, our partners from IMEC, were even able to show that uh, with a foundry compatible, CMOS compatible process, you can even form um, qubits where you can get rid of, of um, processes like liftoff or um, shadow mask evaporation, and instead of that, you were able to kind of use processes from the perspective of former MTJ fab fabrication processes. Um, MTJ is magnetic tunnel junctions for the younger people. <coughs> and uh, that is where I think the most interesting part comes from that they were kind of producing a huge uniform aluminum oxide tunnel barrier on a 300 millimeter wafer and then patterned it specifically at the parts where Josephson junctions are being formed. And these pillars actually were sufficient to actually form transmon qubits. Acknowledged, these transmon qubits are not um, performing in coherence as state-of-the-art qubits, but kind of this starting point should give you an idea that it's actually feasible to do transmon qubits in different ways. And what I mean by different ways is also that they are kind of much more closer to foundry compatibility, meaning that you can also easier potentially engage with uh, the huge foundries which are out there in Europe, US, and in Asia. And that might trigger something which might be very interesting in scaling up um, the massive, nif massive amount of uh, qubits and learnings. For the second part of my talk, I just want to go a little bit closer here to the field of um, research, but also here things can be done in uh, improving um, the, the help or helping the, the quantum engineers to accelerate certain learnings. Namely, um, when we go to this, on the left side, you see a very well knowledgeable, very well known stack of a quantum computer or derived stack. And uh, this is no news to this community, and many of the experimentalists here, I think, would be able to build such a stack. Um, what I want to convey here is that if um, you kind of try to build such a complex system, then you are very much um, starting from the perspective you have an experiment, and um, in this element, the experiment itself, you know very well and you know what you want to build in, in particular, or what experiment you want to execute, then what will happen is you will kind of try to look for the right equipment, hardware equipment, and at a later stage, you find out that you have here all the components together, then you also have to interact with the software and build a good hardware software solution before you actually can start your <coughs> qubit experiments or characterization needs. And Having this in mind, as a PhD student or postdoc, which usually are time-limited 
positions where you want to fastly want to accelerate your outcome so that you can get a lot of papers. Then especially the later part, which we call C here, hardware software integration, can kind of become complicated. And what I mean by complicated, every one of us also know terms like legacy software, or I cannot use it from my colleague. So the maturity of these interactions are not naturally given. And it, that, of course, would lead to delays. And the key thing I want to hunt home here in some way is that we have to think about much more products or integrated products in this field, which help the quantum engineer actually to accelerate his or her learning. And how I see this kind of from the historical perspective is that 40 years ago, um, scientists, for instance, wanted to study the surface of his material, and they had to kind of figure out how to build a scanning atomic force microscope in some way, and then they kind of build it first and then scan their material. Nowadays, you can kind of buy this off the shelf, and then you can thoroughly study your atomic, um, your, your atomic patterns on your chip. And I think we are kind of moving towards this direction, but probably not fast enough. And my example here is a very common theme for a person who is a test engineer who goes into the fab and wants to analyze his chip. You pretty much make an A-B experiment in development, like you want to know what the um, center edge difference is, or you want to do some process splits whatsoever. What you need is um, pretty much a very thorough um, suit of protocols and experiments and um, acknowledged in this field here. This is very common for these um, industry players here in this um, community. This, I would call it, it's a standard set of experiments you need to have to actually get your learning and your correlation, but it's not naturally given in a scientific lab. And just to give you a flavor, how many different experiments you need to perform. This is more like many dozens of experiments. And then the most interesting part is actually to actually build correlations between these individual experiments, starting from spectroscopy, going over um, more easy, easier calibrated single qubit experiments towards even algorithmic benchmarking experiments. <clears throat> and when you think about it, this is quite high task for a PhD student uh, in the lab. And um, from our perspective, and that is what I want to hunt home again, is um, Orange Quantum Systems was thinking about it, how it could help in this respect. And um, all of these protocols and many more are so-called factory acceptance tested in our cryogenic facility, meaning that they are already established, tested, and could be implemented at customer side. Uh, secondly, of course, everybody is talking about um, human influence or automation. Automated processes get also a more and more part of the spectrum of our um, codes. However, what we observe, just a takeaway for you, sometimes automation is even slower as the human being. So it's not naturally given that automation currently in the scientific lab is uh, the key thing you really need. Um, Finally, what we observe is even if you have these functionalities, um, they are not naturally on hardware. You have to build them. And uh, pretty much a single, there is not a single um, solution or, or, or control stack available which provides you with all the bells and whistles, amplifiers, cables, AWGs, control electronics, computers, which actually would offer such a um, broad functionality. And the list is here very long, starting from the control hardware down to the control PC. These are pretty much for a five qubit um, control rack. I think it's about 50 items you need to put, assemble, test, and verify. And then you still have to think about the functionality. And um, we at Orange Quantum Systems assembled such a system for the research community. And um, the pie chart here actually just simplifies also or exemplifies the time it takes for the individual, individual uh, 
uh, protocols to take. And what is not surprising also, not to us, is that the more calibration heavy algorithmic benchmarking ones took almost half of the time of this uh, testing time and thermal cycle. Um, the next thing, if you think about integrated products, and I talked already about uh, legacy hardware software, is consistency. And that is when, uh, works, when it works one after another at, in the same way. And we kind of also, again, use the term factory acceptance testing, and we have <coughs> concrete procedures how to kind of implement these. And what you here see is a spectroscopy and a Rabi experiment on different recs and giving the same results. And the ones who have good glasses, the only difference is the left one has a higher resolution. But what we observe also is that when we use orange recs, which is the control stack I'm talking about, in different uh, cryogenic labs facilities, then it's no longer that identical. You see differences in, in, in parameters to be measured. So the next step is to actually think about how to help uh, the cryo engineer, the, 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 the test engineer, to, to get um, also consistency in a full um, development cycle. And therefore, people have to think about in terms of a single test system for actually providing this um, solution. Um, that's also what we're working on, for instance, on the side in uh, some projects with partners in uh, Delft. On the right side, you see that people are investigating cryo-IO solution with multiple um, few qubit chips inserted, and it's still pending whether we can increase the acceleration and decrease the test time even further, and that will be shown in the upcoming weeks and months. And with this, I want to close this session, or sorry, my presentation, <laughs> uh, with highlighting once more that I think we should think about when we want to build qubits on a larger scale, we have to think about more foundry compatibility in some way and look for good synergies with the big uh, foundries and also extract, of course, the key differences. And the second piece, where I give you only a small example for this research community, is thinking more about integrated products. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. Uh, we have time for two questions. So, any question from the public? If not, uh, maybe let me ask you a question, Torsten. So um, I'm very curious to understand which are the current roadblocks that um, your company is uh, finding in order to achieve reproducibility of QPUs. Can you maybe um, um, describe to us which are those? how to get um, the QPUs um, behaving all similar. Um, yeah, so, so kind of, I have terminology as a system engineer like factory acceptance and site acceptance testing, and that is uh, very time consuming activities, but which should be done by, by um, companies. Um, and out of this, uh, you should be very comfortable with uh, the solution. That's why actually what is meant by product and the product should not vary. And if there is something like a banana product, I would say out there, then uh, the company's responsibility would actually be to, to rectify this. And how to do that is um, in the sphere of room temperature hardware, we accomplished uh, learnings and have uh, very strict protocols to, to ab abide. <laughs> and that you can say it's standard protocols, so maybe new ones might not be covered, but that's um, open in this community also to extend and learn. But the same aspect can also be accomplished in, <coughs> I'm sorry, convinced in the cryogenic environment where people sometimes want to move the attenuators at different places or look for um, cryoflex cables or, or the other solutions which might have different thermal anchoring, but for instance, thermal anchoring is a very important aspect. 
control of the cryo power and knowledge about the cryo power is, is essence to, to learn how kind of the heat can be dissipated and the signal purity can also be analyzed by microwave engineers. Very good, thank you. Um, is there any further questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank uh, Torsten again for this excellent talk. And let's proceed further with Amit uh, Debra, who is uh, working as a researcher at TU Munich. He's going to be describing um, theoretical and experimental methods based on uh, Wigner function to uh, uh, characterize um, states and process and um, in near-term devices, and he's gonna be also showing us some examples from um, IBM um, um, smaller devices. So uh, thank you very much, so please uh, go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I'm Amit, uh, as you said, and uh, I'm working as a PhD student in TU Munich with uh, Professor Stefan Glaser, and I'm within the ecosystem of Munich Quantum Valley. So <clears throat> we developed some tomography approaches for state and processes. And before that, I would like to explain you what these, uh, these tomographs are and like what the Wigner representation is in our case. I'll start with an example of visualization of quantum operators. So uh, let's see. <clears throat> so if we have a two qubit quantum states, which is given by uh, 0 plus 1, or uh, like 0, 0 plus 0, 1, the corresponding density matrix is given by this A. So first term identity is the full cross four identity matrix. And sigma 1z is the state of the qubit 1. And like sigma 2x gives the state of the qubit 2. And sigma 1z 2x is, are the coherence terms. So if you look at it, uh, in the normal skyscraper plot, which is a standard plotting uh, for, for the density matrices, or even for the unitary matrices. So it looks something like this, so that you have uh, the numerical blocks representing the non-zero entries in the, uh, in the density matrix. Uh, so you can see that in this case, only the four, there are only four non-zero entries, and you can visualize the, them as the blocks. But <clears throat> of course, like when it gets complicated, then it's really hard to visualize them. Uh, so in this drops representation, we uh, came up with a solution that to visualize the entire quantum systems. I'll go into mathematics in the later slides, but just to give you present you this example. So you can see that there are four uh, operators. So like the identity matrix corresponding to this part of the density matrix is represented by this sphere here. And sigma 1z is the state of the qubit 1. So red in this case is positive, or like red is positive and green is negative. So the droplet that we call it, so it's parallel to the z-axis. So sigma 1z is this. And sigma 2x is basically parallel to the x-axis. And this is the coherence term, which is described by sigma 1z and 2x here. So if you put the entire system all together, then this is the other density matrix of uh, what this can be visualized using the drops representation, which is discrete representation of operators. And it's very powerful, and you can learn the system dynamics and the more about the quantum systems using this kind of visualization approach. Uh, let's, so we also have the one uh, application, which is called SpinDrops. It's freely available. You are feel free to check it out at the spindrops.org. So this is a powerful real-time interactive quantum simulator and which provides a rich uh, visualization of spin systems. So here I present the, like this is a, a like a screenshot basically from, from this application spin drops, where I give the example of the preparation of Bell state from starting from zero, zero. So here you will see the density matrix, and this is qubit one, qubit two, and this is the coherence terms. So the preparation of Bell state is done in a very uh, well-known way that we apply Hadamard on qubit one, and on qubit one and qubit two, we apply control knot. So I hope this video works. Yes, so you can see in the real time how the qubits are evolving, and, the, and you also see the density matrices evolving. And after applying a control knot gate, you see that qubit one and qubit two both vanishes, and you only have the full coherent system. So, so this is for first Hadamard gate on qubit one, and it also changed the coherence term here, and the control knot will make you end it up in the Bell state. OK, so we are uh, basically then, so this is the spin drop software that, uh, that, we, that is very powerful. And let's look at the mathematics behind it. What does it look like? So if you have a quantum operator, which could be density matrix, processes, or Hamiltonians, so you can visualize it using the following mapping. So if you have a density or like any quantum operator, 
So that's A, for example. We can break it down into these spherical tensor uh, bases. So this is given by Ts. And uh, so these T has rank J and order M. And this can be directly be mapped to the spherical harmonics given here, YJM. So basically, you're mapping the matrix or basically the quantum operators onto the spherical harmonics to visualize them. Just to give you a brief example, so this is for single qubits. So poly operators in terms of uh, tensor basis, is, so this is T00. And this is mapped to Y00, so you only have a, a spherical harmonic of rank 0 and R0, so you have a sphere in the end. And same as here, that we have sigma x, which is a combination of these two operators, so which we map to the spherical harmonics, and you end up with this kind of droplet. And of course, then this is parallel to the x-axis here. Uh, so red is uh, positive and green is negative. And same for sigma y and sigma z, which is a combination of uh, rank one and uh, order one droplet uh, operators. And uh, this is uh, sigma z, which, is, which we call axial tensor operator, because this is always pointing in the axial direction. Yeah, this should have arrived before, but uh, OK. Anyway, so this droplet color corresponds to the phase. So basically, this is the argument. And the distance from center to the surface of the droplet is basically given by the, the absolute value of that. Uh, so basically, we are interested in uh, uh, tomograph these shapes directly. Let's see and how, how this works. So we, uh, in our group, they develop, uh, we developed this scanning approach for tomography. So you can basically compute some expectation values with the, uh, with the operator of interest A. That could be density matrix or process matrix. And you calculate the expectation values with the rotated axial tensor operators. Uh, which is just the rotated version of the tensor operator. So we don't have to go into the detail of mathematics, but let's look at pictorially how this looks like. So imagine that you have a sphere, and you pre-decide like, what at the, all these black points you want to compute the expectation value at. And which is then, so at red arrow, you're computing the expectation value at every time, or like uh, on these desired points, which is a rotation rotated around different angles, betas and alphas. And once you compute that, this is basically the scanning approach. And we can get back these kind of droplet. So <clears throat> which, this is what we used as, our, as the fundamental thing for the state uh, tomography here. So for Wigner state tomography, of course, the density matrices are the operator of interest uh, for these things. Uh, and the spherical droplet function for density matrix can be computed by calculating these expectation values for different angles, betas and alphas. So looking at the algorithm, it looks uh, something like this, that we start with different qubits, q1 to qn. Uh, we have a preparation step, which is the first step here, where we prepare the quantum state that we want to tomograph. This is the rotate, rotation step, which where we uh, basically rotate for different angles, alphas and betas, to compute the expectation value. And the detection associated rotations, these are some non-unitary uh, operations. Uh, sorry, these are some local unitary operations, which is applied to compute the expectation value of some non-observables. So if you look at the single qubit uh, state tomography uh, in this form, so these are the, for single qubit, we need to calculate or compute these two droplets, so F0 and F1, which can be uh, computed by calculating these expectation values, so identity and sigma z. And we know that identity, the expectation value of identity would always be 1. So the quantum circuit looks something like this. So we have preparation step for this particular state. Oh, sorry about that. But we have a rotation step, so beta, alpha, 0. So we are just rotating around uh, different points on the sphere. And sigma z can be directly observed or can be directly measured uh, in, the, in the pure state devices. So we don't re really require the last step. So when we perform that, we actually see that this is the experimental droplet on the top, and the simulated droplet is at the bottom. Uh, for this particular state. Of course, the simulated droplet is plotted for many different points, so it's quite smooth. But experimentally, of course, like if you choose many points, then the number of experiments would, uh, would also increase. So we only perform it for some number of uh, experiments. Uh, and this is basically IBM, uh, IBM's data. Uh, and from, based on these experimental droplets, we can also compute the density matrices. And uh, then you can also all do all the interesting stuff that you want to do. Uh, so this is some other single qubit results from, uh, from the IBM Lagos, which we performed for these number of shots. And these are the number of angles that we chose for our experiments. So this is zero state, this is y state, and this is some random state on the block sphere. 
And we also did it for the Bell State. So here you see that Bell State, like as I showed you in the video example, that uh, Bell State is a fully uh, entangled state, so there's no component of qubit 1 and qubit 2 visible here. The only term which is like uh, focused on is the coherence term. So that's basically this one. And we were also able to experimentally uh, tomograph it with, uh, with this fidelity. And uh, we also took one step further to do some Wigner process tomography. So for the Wigner process tomography, like, or in generally in the process tomography, we are interested in uh, uh, tomographing the gate or a time evolution operator or a quantum process. So that can be done if we can, so we can use the same approach that I showed you for the state tomography if we can map uh, the processes onto the density matrices. To do that, we actually use one Ancilla qubit, Q0, and Q1 to Q1 are the system qubits. So we apply a control U kind of operator to do this kind of mapping. The idea is that on Q0, we prepare, Q0 we prepare in a, a superposition state, so that's this one, and Q1 to Qn we prepare in a fully mixed state. Uh, so when we perform the control U onto that, then in the equation nine you can see that the, uh, the process operators are mapped onto the off diagonals of the density matrices, and we can use the same approach for doing the process tomography. So there are four key steps here, and Q0 is an ancilla qubit, and Q1 to Qn are your system qubits. So in the preparation step, or in the first block here of the circuit, we basically uh, prepare the Q0 in a superposition state and Q1 to Qn in a uh, maximally mixed state. And we do the mapping step, so we basically apply this quantum circuit over here, and U is the process that you want to tomograph. And we, of course, apply the rotation step on the system qubits for the scanning purpose. Then we apply some local unitary operations as the part of the low uh, detection associated rotations to observe some, uh, or calculate the expectation values of some non-observables. Okay, and let's look at the single, well, the single qubit Wigner process tomography. So we have, of course, two qubits required for the single qubit strip process tomography, and these are the four expectation values that we need to compute. So sigma 0x, y, sigma xz, and sigma yz. So these are four expectation values that we need to compute. And as you uh, are well aware that uh, for the pure state quantum computing, it's not possible to prepare the fully mixed state directly because, uh, because you are in the pure state. So we use the temporal averaging approach to prepare a fully mixed state. And to do that, what we do is basically, so these are four quantum circuits, and uh, let's divide in two sets of these quantum circuits. So A and B basically compute the expectation value sigma 0x and sigma xz. And here, in the preparation step, we start Q1 with a zero state in here, and we let it run for the preparation step. And in Q1 in the circuit B, we apply a NOT gate afterwards. So the state after preparation step is basically one. And in the end, we take the, uh, the average of the measurement outcomes of circuit A and B to mimic basically the uh, maximally mixed state. And the same for circuit C and D basically computes these two expectation values and uh, we take the average of these two measurement outcomes to mimic a uh, maximally mixed state. We also perform these experiments on IBM uh, quantum system, so again, IBM Lagos device for a uh, different number of angles, uh, for eight beta angles and 15 uh, azimuthal angles. And here you can see that the, these are the simulated and at the top of the experimental reconstructed droplets. So for NOT gate, for example, which is parallel to the x-axis, uh, so basically in this case, the droplets are parallel to the uh, rotation, uh, rotation axis. And this is the Hadamard gate, which is parallel to the axis between x and z. And this is 3 pi over 2 y rotation. So you can see that we, with very good fidelity, we were able to reconstruct these experimental droplets as well. Um, and of course, in order to make it uh, more available to all the other people. So for the community, we developed this on um, drops tomo. Uh, this is a Python package for performing single and two qubit uh, state tomography and process tomography. Uh, so you can, users can directly simulate it on the, quant uh, on the simulator, on the quasim simulator, or also plug it into the real quantum hardwares. Uh, right now it's based with Qiskit, but of course it's, um, it can be expanded, so let us know if you, if you are, if you have questions about that. And the tutorials are available on this uh, GitHub profile here. Let me just give you a glimpse of single qubit state tomography, like how can it be done. 
So we basically pip and so we basically pip install the dropstormo package and uh, import the modules, and you can. Uh, with a few lines of code, you can uh, actually perform this entire step with the state tomography to basically get back at these very interactive droplets. So this is a Python-based thing. So you, like this is, uh, you can just rotate it around in the 3D and like you can play around with the, all the droplets as well. Uh, and with this, I would like to summarize that we developed the general approach for the Wigner state and process tomography, which is based on this uh, uh, paper on archive. And we also demonstrated this on the IBM systems, but of course it's expandable to other uh, near-term quantum devices as well. And of course, uh, in the Dropstromo, you can use the pip install for downloading the packages, and let us know or let me know if you have any questions regarding that. We'd be happy to talk to you. And uh, the, so there is one a small thing that you might have noticed uh, that, that for the unknown processes, the work is under progress. The only thing is that uh, for for this existing approach, we need to apply this control U kind of propagator. But uh, if U or the process is not unknown, then you cannot do the control U, which is basically impossible. So we basically have developed this kind of uh, a new circuit. So this is uh, under progress, and uh, we have very good promising results. Uh, so the paper might be out in a few months on archive. Feel free to check that out. And with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, Professor Glasser and. Uh, to your Munich uh, team and uh, Munich Quantum Valley and the SQA organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Amit. So time for questions, uh, please. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Could you elaborate how it fares, like what's the computational cost for uh, for a state and process and how it fares with standard quantum process tomography and standard quantum state tomography with num uh, increasing number of qubits? Yeah, yeah. So of course, like we do not claim that this is a better st state and process tomography in comparison to the existing, the standard approach. But uh, so without uh, like investing much further, uh, like, uh, qubits or like gates, you can actually learn about the systems way better and you can visualize these qubits directly. So this is the key idea about this. And of course, like when I say that we use the eight and 15, like 120 experiments for this kind of state tomography, you can also decrease that. So I have that in my backup slide so I can just show you. So, so like when I showed you these angles, uh, these are basically different sampling schemes on the, on the sphere. So this is the, Experiments were performed for the equiangular grid point, but you, we also have some pretty good or pretty decent uh, grid points, for example, Repulsion and Lebedev. And so we did the experiments with them and compared it with the uh, standard IBM experiment, like standard uh, state tomography experiments as well. So as we can see that with the total number of shots, uh, like the mean fidelity is, is in the range as well. And in some cases, it's better than the standard uh, state tomography as well. So, yeah. So uh, to get an unknown state, there is no fixed number of experiments you need to do. It's like the more you do, it's better. I, I cannot understand. This. So to get the unknown quantum state, there is no fixed number of experiments you need to do to retrieve the unknown state. Or is there a fixed number of experiments you need to perform? So, uh, uh, so even if it's the unknown state, you can choose uh, the number of points according to you. So, de depending on this kind of sampling schemes, so it's not fixed. It's up to you, like with what resolution you want to see the the droplets, and of course, you can decrease it uh, considerably as well, and you can uh, st still get back these droplets. But of course, when you do small, like little number of experiments, then you might not be able to visualize these uh, these states properly. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, more questions? So, maybe let me <clears throat> ask a question myself. So, uh, could you comment on the comparison uh, or the efficiency or the advantages of this uh, method with respect to, to others? Is it about the visualization that you provide or is there also an advantage in terms of precision or, or of any other kind? 
Yeah, so like, of course, when you do more number of experiments, the precision is better. And uh, so, of course, the advantage, as you said, is the visualization. And uh, I think it's the, the most fundamental thing that we were looking for. Uh, like, uh, for example, like in this case, like, uh, for example, if you look at this kind of density matrix, which is really noisy, I really should look something like, well, yeah. so it should look something like that. The state qubit one and qubit two are parallel to the z axis and x axis, respectively. But in this kind of noisy environment or like noisy density matrix, we can see that the qubit one and qubit two are also kind of rotated around different axes. So this kind of, uh, this also makes it powerful for the visualization approach. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions at the moment, so let's thank the speaker again for this excellent talk. And so before proceeding further, let me maybe remark that um, we have now our last speaker of the session, since unfortunately Anurag Saha from Cruz is unable to deliver his talk today. So. Um, but let me introduce you to our speaker now, Sultan Simboras, and uh, he's heading, heading the quantum computing research group at the um, Wigner Research Center for Physics, and he's going to be describing a novel compilation method that provides very efficient decomposition of gates that um, reduces significantly the number of gates in an algorithm for certain circuits, and I'm looking forward for your talk, Sultan. So, stage. Thank you very much for this introduction and for this precise summary of uh, what I'm going to talk about, actually. And uh, within this session um, of benchmarking and enabling software, this belongs more to the enabling software and to a little bit more high-level enabling software that we heard from the first talk and partially from the second talk. Namely, we will talk about how to decompose a unitary that defines a quantum program. What do we mean by this? Well, it also depends on the architecture, but usually for superconducting qubits architectures, and we are in such a conference working on superconducting qubits, we want to decompose unitaries in a way that we will have a single qubit gates single qubit rotations and two qubit gates, typically C naughts or control Z, but there are also some other type of native two qubit gates for different superconducting qubit architectures. And the uh, goal is obviously to have uh, the fewer gates or uh, the uh, smaller depth we have, the better it is for a fixed unitary. And uh, in, in such decomposition schemes, often, we want to see the, I mean, we are only approximating the unitary like uh, to a great extent, and obviously the best uh, thing would be to, to uh, characterize this approximation by the, by the diamond norm. That's the most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, physical norm that you can have for uh, quantum processes, channels, and unitaries. Uh, however, from a numerical standpoint, it is uh, standard to use the so-called uh, Frobenius norm. He, here I denote the Frobenius norm of a generic operator, and if we have two unitaries, we just uh, take the difference between them, and, and then uh, this defines you the, the cost function of the optimization that we usually use. By the way, this is very much related to the uh, usual gate fidelity, which is the trace u dagger v for u and v. <clears throat> and, uh, of, and this is like very standard that uh, different type of software that uh, do gate decompositions use this uh, norm for, the, for, for their optimization and for, for uh, getting the cost function. And obviously we are not the only ones who work on this problem. Uh, there are quite a few uh, tools that you can use. I, I uh, mentioned a uh, Couple of them here from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. You have the QFAS and the QSearch, and then uh, from ETH uh, Zurich, you have the Universal Q, Q compiler. And obviously, Ticket is actually a great and very easy, uh, well uh, used uh, uh, software for such a <clears throat> for such a thing. And uh, like the optimal gate decomposition is usually to have the fewest gate. Most precise, more precisely, it's usually the fewest 
two qubit case that you have, let's say, the fewest uh, C nodes. Uh, it's very, uh, another would be the depth, but it, these are uh, very much related to each other. <clears throat> and I'm not going to talk about the methods that the others use. I'm going to talk about our method a little bit and then show some benchmark compared to the other methods. So our method is super simple. That's the <laughs> best way to say it. If we have uh, four qubits, what you see here, then we have basically type of very easy blocks which we are optimizing over very easy blocks of gates. I mean, one type of blocks are the following thing, if you have four qubits, is that we take the first qubit and there are controlled Y rotations to all the other qubits. That's one, one block. And there are also one qubit gates on the, this first qubit and the other qubit where we have the controlled knot rotations. If we would have more than four qubits, we would do the same just with more control knots. And this is one block. And we repeat this one block a couple of times, the, the number of times that we need to. And after that, we, what, what our cost function does is actually that it decouples this Q0, the first qubit, from the others, that, the, that after a while, the big unitary, which we, like, like we multiply the sequence with the, with the unitary that we want to achieve, and we want that the whole thing will be, or, or actually, we want that to be identity, and then we have an expansion of the inverse unitary, and then we can get, of course, the decomposition of the original unitary. <clears throat> and, uh, and we have these type of blocks a couple of times, and then blocks only on the, the last three qubits, and then blocks on the last two qubits, but the, for two qubits, we know how to efficiently decompose unitaries. So it's a very uh, easy method, I would say the most straightforward, but then we checked it for generic unitaries, let's say random unitaries, the, the hardest unitaries, and it turned out that actually this type of decomposition, uh, when, uh, when we relate it to C naughts, like of course the controlled Y rotation can be easily related to two C naughts. The C naught count matches very well with the theoretical minimum of the hardest unit, uh, hardest unitaries for four qubits, five qubits, six qubits. We have a paper on that, the first paper, what I mentioned in the, or what you can see in the first slide. But then, of course, usually in quantum computation, we don't have like the hardest unitaries, like a random unitary, but like more structured unitaries. So in that case, uh, we do actually an adaptive technique, which is that we have the cost function and we, we get the uh, good uh, angles for uh, the good parameters for decomposing uh, unitary uh, for a uh, for a, a, a given unitary for a long sequence of C naughts and one qubit gates, and then we remove these block one by one and then re-optimize the other parameters. And it turns out that actually we only have to re-optimize a little bit and then we, we do until we cannot remove any more. And then we try another removal and so on. And, and in that way, we get very good C not count, which I will show you. But there is one catch that this is computationally super expensive. Okay, let's see what we did exactly from numbers. So we took this paper, which actually uh, benchmarked the, uh, the QFAS and the Q search, uh, and, and we benchmarked the, with the same unitaries, our, our gate decomposer, which is the squander, and here are the results. These are these, uh, these fine names, these label the unitaries that we have to decompose, and then there is like uh, uh, the initial uh, C naught count, what we have, then how uh, we, we plug in the full unitary, then we decompose it with Qiskit, QFAST, and QSearch, and it turns out that except for one single unitary here, our C0 count is the lowest compared to the rest of them. And then, if you see here, we took also other, these unitaries which are taken from their papers, and you see that our C0 counts are, are the smallest, and like it's much, much smaller than, say, Qiskit, but also uh, lower than, uh, you can see here, 25, 37, than QFAS and QSearch. The problem was that 
as I told you, it's computationally not very efficient. We could do it for four, five qubit gates. So how to, um, how to handle uh, larger unitaries? Well, there are two ways to do a brute force hardware way and to do some tricky optimization. We did both. I'm going to mostly report about the brute force hardware way, hardware uh, <laughs> to take the brute force hardware and, and uh, do some uh, tricky stuff. We didn't uh, look at bigger and bigger CPUs. Instead, actually, we went to an, or my co-authors and myself, went to an other paradigm, not like, a, not like this usual CPU paradigm, but something which is called data flow computing. Originally, uh, so data flow computing uh, is basically like a spatially parallelized computation where the data goes spatially in different, let's say, small coprocessors. And, and uh, you keep track in time what you do with the data, and then, then, uh, and then in the end get the result. So it's, there is no central processing unit here or, or anything like that. I mean, obviously, this works in, I just showed for the fun, like in robotics, it goes like that, that of course, the, that the cars go, and at each step, uh, the car goes to the next step. But you can do the same thing with, uh, with data. I mean, this is an alternative to the usual von Neumann type of computation. People do this with FPGAs, but also recently this has been done with tensor processing units. And actually, uh, there is a company uh, we got in contact with Grok by accident. We, had, we were in contact with a FPGA company called Maxelerer, and now uh, Grok bought this. And Grok is actually a sort of like a spin off of Google, at least the people who found it, it were the ones who developed the tensor processing units for Google, and they have this uh, processor called ThinkFast, the Tensor Streaming Processor, TSP, uh, and, um, and, and which, which is uh, based on these data flow engines. And since we were already in contact with this small company that they bought, and they were very interested, as you can see, this Grok in, in uh, quantum computation. For example, they, I mean, the US Army is one of their uh, their investors, and, uh, and uh, they, they have already done uh, some kind of moves towards quantum computation, and we, we were allowed to run our algorithms or, on their TPUs, and in fact, my code you know, so works for this company, and uh, what happened is that now we could go up to nine qubits with the easy, uh, with, with, with a couple of chips and with many chips up to 12 qubits. And here you can see that with our method, there is a dramatic decrease of, of, of uh, C naught. I mean, uh, let, let me show one C naught. Uh, for example, for this unitary, uh, like Kiskit gives 625. Uh, C nodes, this IBM QX uh, gives you 112, and we get 47. Or for this unitary in the last, this kit would decompose it to uh, 55,000 C nodes, this IBM QX to 415, and we decompose it only to 229. So we get a huge um, <coughs> decrease in uh, C naught number with this software. And, and OK. We use this brute force uh, way of having a very big uh, hardware for this. But we also now are going towards direction where we use uh, much more trickier algorithms for reaching the optimal of the cost function. And let me show you. So if we use um, nice gradient-based methods or, or usual, uh, yeah, usual optimization methods like ADAM, then you see that we, we reach, I mean, it's very hard. We have to do many, many, many iterations to, to lower the cost function. And we have now developed a new type of, uh, we have adapted to our purpose an evolutionary algorithm. I mean, you know how evolutionary algorithm works. It means that, that, uh, that we, have, we, we look at uh, optimizers with, with different parameters, and then 
uh, we look at how well they behave, and then we kill uh, those that, that, that didn't optimize very well, and then the new ones make, we copy them and make new mutations, and then also kill them, and, and the good mutation survives, I mean, in a very hand-waving way, I can say. And even for now a 25-qubit circuit, which we couldn't previously decompose well, now we are able to decompose. And this is what, uh, what I want to say to you. For, it, it, for us, it was like uh, we were surprised that we could go up to 25 qubits. And uh, uh, the conclusion is that we have this squander software package, the sequential quantum gate decomposer. You can uh, download it from GitHub, from my co-authors uh, GitHub. And you have this quantum gate compilation software there that I showed you. Also, we have a state preparation module. And at this stage, we have this gradient descent, but uh, there will be this new, uh, <clears throat> new type of evolutionary quantum machine learning or, or, or uh, machine learning type of uh, uh, machine learning type of uh, module also there. So, thanks a lot for the. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice talk. So, any question from the public? So, please. So, if you want to decompose unitary matrix of size n, then how the number of angles grow with n? It is n factorial or? Okay, n qubits, yeah. Unitary of, yeah, size n times n. Yes, so, so if you have n qubits, you ask how many C nodes you need. That's what your question is, was that? No, no, how, uh, what is the number of parameters in the optimization function? Number it, of n so how, how many parameters do you, you need, yeah. right? Yes, yes. Well, the parameters count is for a generic unitary, it's easy, right? Because if you have n qubits, we know that you have a generic unitary, uh, or a, let's say a special unitary, because the phase doesn't matter. And we know for a d-dimensional unitary, uh, you have d squared parameters. If it's a special unitary, then d squared minus 1. So if d is 2 to the n, then it's unfortunately exponentially many. And this is what you do, generally, or you have so, no, so no, from no. this, this you can see that obviously you will need exponentially many C nodes. It's an easy, this is an easy exercise. However, very easy lower bounds uh, that has been developed almost 20 years before show that actually the number of C naught counts for n qubit grows as uh, actually Miko, you were involved in that four to the n, and there is a one to the four. No, no, and no, no. it turns out, for, in our case, we have checked it up to t cube, uh, 10 qubits, the upper bounds are much worse, that actually that lower bound, which is easy to get, is probably the best. But let me stress, Dimitri, that this is for the worst unitaries, like, like a random unitary where you need the most C nodes. Like for the, those unitaries that appear in quantum computing, you need much, more, much less C nodes. But it's very hard to get the optimization. But I'm not talking about C nodes. I'm talking about free angles. Yeah, so, I mean so the angles have, are, 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 are okay. The angles are four to the n. Four to the n. For generic unitaries, yes. Okay. So, for example, you have shown example for nine qubits. So you have optimized over two to the power eighteen parameters. Yes. So for the worst qubit, with, with, yeah. with your gen, gen, genetic random search, or how it was called, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yes, exactly. Very good. So, please, another question. I, um, thank you. Uh, so, you showed some, some tables of, of benchmarking with many different circuits. Um, I was just, um, could you comment on how those benchmarking circuits are chosen? Are, are those circuits that are sort of supposed to be representative of of, of a useful algorithm or, or? This is a great question. I would not have chosen those circuits, by the way. Uh, the only reason we chose those circuits, I mean, a much better would be, for example, to have some 
tricky Fourier transform, but let's say obfuscate a little bit or something like that. The only reason we, by the way, the Fourier transform is, is here, but not like in an obfuscated way. The only reason we took this, these circuits with these strange names, is because we wanted to um, be unbiased. So it's not we who choose the, uh, the, the unitaries, but some people who have already done benchmarking, and then we, we apply our software to that. That was the only reason we did that. But actually, by the way, it would be very, very interesting and cool to, and we are working on, actually, I'm also involved in this uh, open super queue, I had the label, to have like a very good set of benchmark circuits, maybe some other than, than these. Thank you. So thanks for the question. Very good. Uh, any more questions? Yes. That would be our last question today. Nico. And I was encouraged to ask you a question. So um, um, the, um, your way of doing these blocks, and you said that you repeat the blocks. Exactly. Like, did you find that that way is much more efficient than the standard QR decomposition that we were working on? This is exactly what we found. It's very strange. Do you know the reason? No. Okay. No. Honestly, no. This was like the easiest thing that could even come to your mind before this usual decomposition, and we have no idea. We just tested it. Very good. So, excellent. So, thanks a lot again to the speaker and uh, to the rest of the speakers of this morning and before closing the session let me give the floor to my colleague Stefan who would like to give some announcement yeah I'm always the boring guy doing the boring announcements we have a lunch break now but before you leave um, please be aware that there are three workshops coming up one is at one o'clock from Quantware that's happening downstairs then at 2 30 there are two one from Zurich Instruments downstairs and one from Quantrolox that's in that room that you need to use the elevator for on third floor. It's hard to miss, except the elevator to the right, and there is just one room. Um, so you can take your food with you if you haven't finished it before that, so you can take your food within the room, be cautious if there is any devices or something, but in principle that should be possible. Um, Poster session will now take place both on ground floor and upper floor uh, to leave more space for discussion and so on. And uh, we gather here again at 3.30 for the next session, which will be high fidelity operations. I wish you uh, a good lunch break. Enjoy and see you later.
So welcome back, welcome back from the poster session and the coffee break and the lunch break and all of the very interesting workshops. Um, we are continuing with the next scientific session here, which is on high fidelity elementary operations, gates, readout and reset. Part one will be followed by part two. But now I'm happy to announce Juha, Juha Hustle as our first speaker here. Uh, telling us more about the high fidelity gates and the progress uh, in uh, from IQM and so we are uh, looking forward to the presentation please okay thanks Stefan honor to be here um, uh, indeed I will be talking uh, about our high fidelity high fidelity building blocks of our quantum computers but I will be taking uh, a little bit of a liberty to go beyond so I will also describe how to build uh, full quantum processors and full quantum com computing systems using the uh, qubit and coupler solutions that we are applying. So what we, I will be showing is to uh, review some results of our qubit coupler concept on the fidelity data from that, and then also uh, discussing the scaling into full quantum processors, like uh, showing this roadmap of the first Four QPU generations shown here as topologies, and uh, we'll be showing some element level and full QPU results to, to support the um, conclusions. So basically, then uh, I'll start from this uh, tunable coupler concept with transform qubits, which, which we are using. So uh, our approach to doing these two qubit gates is motivated by this MIT Will Oliver's group paper from 2018, which is uh, shown there on the top right corner. And uh, that is sort of, uh, um, the coupling is controlled by uh, driving uh, baseband flux pulses to the middle qubit that is act acting as the coupler for the data qubits that are the left and the right ones. And uh, an additional feature is that there is also the direct coupling uh, between the two qubits. And uh, this arrangement effectively enables it uh, the ideal uh, zero coupling idling point when the coupling is turned off. And, uh, but uh, then uh, how we have modified that at IQM is uh, uh, shown on the below picture. So uh, the important feature is this coupling extenders that are waveguides uh, connecting the coupler to the qubits. And by this way, we enable to make it more compliant to the um, uh, large scale qubit lattices by having the physical space for all microwave elements of the QPU and also uh, minimizing the next nearest neighbor coupling of the uh, qubits when you're coming to it. So basically, but the effective Hamiltonian is as described on the topmost picture as well. And uh, this has been shown to uh, yield uh, fast, uh, high fidelity two qubit gates. And uh, indeed, this is the data set of, uh, and, and the physical microscope image showing the physical implementation of, of the qubits. So about two millimeter spacing between the qubits and uh, um, and the coupler, and uh, we have been able to demonstrate 99.8% uh, uh, fidelity about uh, for the ZZ gate and in the interleaved randomized benchmarking. I'm not going too deep into the details, but I suggest to look at this PRX paper where it's uh, described to a great level of detail. Um, then uh, on, on the scaling, so uh, on top of the qubits and couplers, you clearly for large qubit lattices need uh, to route the signals to the qubits. And uh, one thing that this um, up co concept uh, alleviates is that you can, uh, it is very well suitable for this flip chip configuration that we're also using that. And uh, basically, the, it enables uh, routing the signals in uh, spaces where the cross coupling to the qubits and couplers are minimized. So it's uh, shown here in the plot as this cross capacitance uh, multiplier showing that we get a significant cross coupling suppression on this side when the geometry of the structure is uh, designed in an ideal way. And uh, uh, then a little bit on further when you really start building these qubit lattices. So basically, as I said, we believe these are high fidelity fast gates with zero coupled idling and also in, at IQM we have chosen that we will uh, implement the quantum processors up to at least 150 qubits so that we will have this full nearest neighbor coupling in the qubit lattice. So 
uh, uh, this is um, uh, because we believe on the performance data and also the coupling. Uh, we got strong advice from the um, algorithms people that for the performance, uh, our requests in the engineering side to leave some couplers out to simplify were uh, not heard well. So we are, have decided to do the full coupling here. So basically the trade-off here is that we have a significantly larger number of physical qubits than the data qubits, the actual qubits setting your QPU scale. So we really believe that the performance improvement is worth this engineering overhead. So we will have like this um, number of physical qubits uh, is basically what sets the complexity in fabrication, in system integration, all that, but really we foresee it to be worth the, the engineering overhead there. And uh, this shows a little bit also on how this is becoming into reality. So we have the photographs of the first three generations of QPUs up to 54 qubits. Uh, the 150 qubit one is still a design rendering because it doesn't exist in the physical world quite yet. Um, uh, and, and for the 54 qubit chip, we have now uh, recently fabricated it in collaboration with VTT. So it's been traveling a little bit between the two clean rooms of IQM and VTT. Um, okay, so then uh, I'll mention a few words about the enablers of this. So coming from the uh, to the QPU and to the full system, uh, quite superficially as there is limited time here, but um, just uh, first of all, this QPU design, so I refer you to this KQ circuits uh, design framework. It's an open source framework. Please go ahead and check if you are interested in designing quantum devices. Um, we have at IQM designed all our QPUs using this stuff, so we, it works quite nicely having the scripted uh, way of defining the uh, designs and also you can export uh, structures to the finite element simulations uh, uh, com for commercial and, uh, and, and open source public uh, simulation frameworks. And then we already, or, already heard a um, presentation by Wei Liu yesterday on the fabrication side. I'll still briefly revisit, so we have recently indeed open this 200 millimeter fabrication line and getting quite nice results, have, are able to now do full QPUs in the uh, clean room and uh, getting to the point where uh, the clean room is becoming an asset instead of an, just an overhead. So I believe it's going to help our research um, in the upcoming times quite strongly and really nice results uh, from our fabrication teams showing this uh, high yield uh, wafer level junction processes up to 40,000 squids probe that room temperature. And uh, still the system integration. I know many of you are building qubit setups, and maybe you can respect that when you go to the tens of or hundreds of physical qubits, the engineering aspects are becoming quite uh, challenging. So you will need to think of uh, routing the microwave signals, having thousands of connections per system. Still today, uh, pretty much handcrafted manual work to do all the connections and uh, uh, all the careful engineering of the microwave properties of the QPU package, the uh, cabling, filtering, attenuators, shielding. Uh, this is really a uh, non-negligible part of the work we, we need to do to make quantum computers work um, functional. And uh, uh, one more thing is the, the uh, software. So this is a simplified description of how the IQM software stack looks like. So we have these uh, uh, basically two ways to operate quantum computers. So the XI experiment automation is a layer where you can do the low level pulse level programming of your uh, control sequences and uh, you can do the calibrations. You can test different things on a low level, obviously needing to know what a lot from the underlying hardware there, but then this uh, Cortex is the algorithm execution framework where you can uh, describe your algorithms with uh, known high-level frameworks and description lamb, which is like Sir Kiskit and Open Custom. And um, then the lower levels of the stack are responsible of converting that obviously to the uh, physical control signals through the control electronics. Okay, so then um, next thing maybe this is 
you, some of you might find the most interesting here. So these are the performance data now uh, from the 20 qubit QPUs, the fidelity data of the single and two qubit gate operations. So uh, I have to emphasize that this is the very first batch of QPUs ever f coming fully through the IQM's own facility. So it is sort of a unique data set I'm expecting us to improve significantly in a, even a short time span. But uh, we are sort of getting already decently nice, nice data like this uh, single qubit gate fidelity in the order of three nines of, uh, and, and uh, 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 this uh, two qubit gate CZ fidelity done by this simultaneous interleaved randomized benchmarking. Simultaneous meaning here that uh, it's done in, I think, four sets, uh, this calibration, so that uh, obviously one qubit is coupled to only one qubit, so you cannot all obviously run all of them simultaneously, but the maximal simultaneity given that you don't want to uh, do overlapping gates. And uh, maximum fidelity on this QPU level, we are still a little bit behind of what I showed on the uh, in the isolated test structures, but up to over 99% and median also being there exceeding 98%. Maybe the same data may be more easily visualizable at glances to show these uh, cumulative um, distribution functions showing the, the, the uh, level. So some underliers still there in the data. Uh, we know, um, we think we know uh, some of the limitations, and we, we also know solutions to overcome these with uh, minor design changes and also uh, still improving the fabrication realized parameters. But uh, for the first batch, I think it's nice and a good starting point to start improving. Um, then uh, one more thing, um, uh, a little bit higher, higher level uh, benchmarking results, this time from our five qubit quantum processor. So this is now we have executed this uh, uh, benchmark introduced by the Eviden uh, company, part of the ADAS group, concentrating on the uh, high performance computing solutions. But uh, they have this specific um, benchmarking for this uh, QAOA. Uh, which uses this uh, example algorithm MaxCut with QAOA to uh, um, benchmark a QPU against, um, um, well, how well it works in this uh, particular problem. And uh, what is plotted here is this so-called uh, uh, Q-score ratio beta. That is a parameter which describes, uh, it's a figure of merit of how well uh, the solution works for um, for the for, for this max cut problem as compared to completely random solution. So if if you don't get if the so added value of the quantum computing is none compared to just guessing, uh, then your beta is zero. If you get the optimal solution, your um, number is one. And uh, the plot here shows comparing the uh, noiseless simulator using this ADOS quantum learning machine as, as the simulation platform and uh, the uh, execution at the uh, IQM's um, five qubit, qubit physical quantum computer. And uh, the definition of the Q score is that if you ex exceed 0.2, then, then you're, you hit the Q score of, of the number of qubits involved in the computation. And uh, we have indeed with this five qubit uh, design hit the Q score of five qubits. Still somewhat below, obviously, for the noiseless case, but uh, quite nice result, at least in my opinion, anyways. Um, okay, uh, one more thing. Um, so a couple of more things. So I, I have been here mainly concentrating on these um, baseline quantum processor uh, topologies and generations. So we are also at IKEA working on this so-called core design approach, like finding uh, topologies for QPUs for certain problems that benefit from uh, deviating from, let's say, this baseline. So this is the one that we've been mostly addressing recently is this, this um, uh, so uh, effective star topology. So basically uh, increasing the connectivity beyond even this uh, next nearest level lattice to basically having um, this uh, connectivity through the center element between all the qubits or through one extra step through the center element, which is another resonator. And uh, what is quoted here is um, this um, 
fidelity numbers that are moving the quantum state to the resonator and this uh, sort of a double, double move and uh, CZ gate, double uh, gate, um, making effective ZZ between the two qubit, qubits in this uh, structure. So um, there were some posters, I think yesterday, so I hope you had a chance to discuss with Chang Sheng on, on the topic. Uh, also feel free to look at this future research paper where the concept is on theory level described a little bit more. And also, as said, our qubits are still in the QPUs based on transmons, but also we have been working on this alternative uh, qubits like Unimon being this uh, high unharmonicity uh, qubit that well, we also heard about also already from this Alta University presentation. We are collaborating with Alta on this, uh, on this uh, uh, readout concept of the Unimon there, but also please feel free to take take a look at this nature communications paper we had uh, on this before. And uh, okay, so this is my message. So I described to you the uh, qubit coupler concept enabling fast case high fidelity and how we start building the large qubit lattices using those and uh, um, also show the benchmarks of the single qubit pairs and also the full full QPU level. And, uh, flashed our near-term roadmap after this 150 data qubit system. So this was my message. And uh, of course, this has been quite an extensive collaboration at the company, so we have quite a lot of contributors here, uh, all of them highly appreciated, and some public funding has been received to, to the parts, support the part of this work, so this is acknowledged here. And um, I was talking about high fidelity gates, so um, if you are, uh, interested to experience them hands-on, so uh, as you've heard already before here, we, this IKEM Spark system and it gives you this feeling, so feel free to ask more from our representatives, representatives here at, at the SQA conference and or approach us otherwise. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Juha, for this very interesting and wonderful talk about uh, this uh, interesting new results. Thanks a lot and promising results. So I'm looking forward to the questions. Please, the board is open for discussions. Please, Patrice. Thank you. So, so you, you mentioned that your coupler is designed so that you can uh, tune it off, right, the coupling. And so did, did you... Uh, see this in the in the in the. Did you see that it has it is important in your randomized benchmarking of the two qubit gates? I mean, can you comment on this? Uh, yes, I. Well, first of all, we have. If you look at the paper on it, it has been obviously uh, demonstrated that this is the case, and I, I believe this is important. I. Uh, so basically, if the idling qubits are leaking to other qubits. I think it leads to somehow obviously to error mechanisms that probably increase with system scale and possibly also if you go to higher, higher coherence systems. So then um, I, I would guess it is uh, uh, an important thing that we need to mitigate. Florian? Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question. So you showed nice uh, single and two qubit data for this chip, for the 20 qubit chip. Could you also comment on readout? Like what's the average readout fidelity that you can achieve and how many qubits can you multiplex? Uh, uh, okay, so uh, for the readout fidelity, we have a um, measured, let's say, it depends on many things, but for these uh, full QPUs, I think we've, Typically, measure readout fidelity is above 95% or so, so not that great. Uh, there has been a lot of improvement, and we also know how to uh, improve that. So for the small-scale small systems, we have uh, readout demonstrations exceeding 99% and uh, uh, multiplexed readout slightly below that, but um, it is still something we are working on to improve. So, 
If there is no further question, let me ask one question. I was wondering actually about the length. You showed this uh, two qubit, this tunable coupler, and you said that its length is about 1.5 millimeter or so, if I understand it correctly. Ideally, you want to get small, uh, closer and closer to, to squeeze more and more qubits on a chip. So is this kind of optimized for crosstalk, or what is kind of the uh, it thoughts is the going in there? Yeah, it is the trade-off, obviously, that uh, when you would like to do maybe a somehow contradictory intuitively that you would like to do this dense packing. And uh, um, uh, this uh, 1.5 to 2 millimeters has been chosen uh, for the compromises. And I, I think uh, we have chosen, shown that at least in this level, well, the QPUs that we are designing are still implemented, uh, can be implemented. We've been uh, looking into the box modes and all that, so we can manage the chip size. Um, of course, if you go into still further, further, bigger QPUs, there might be the temptation to start squeezing, and it's of course a trade-off. But for these QPU scales, this couple of millimeters is uh, good for the fitting all the microwave designs nicely and also minimizing the next nearest neighbor coupling to sufficient level. So. Okay, super. Thanks a lot, and thanks again for the very nice talk. Okay. Thank you. So with this, we're coming to our next speaker in this session, which is uh, Liang Yu Chen from Chalmers University, who will tell us about qubit state discrimination techniques for accurate quantum error correction. Please. Thank you so much, Stefan, for the nice introduction. Uh, my name is Liang Yuchen, and I'm a future student from Chalmers University of Technology. So today, I'm here to talk about our recent work on improving readout fidelity for superconducting qubits and how we can move forward to improve also the quantum correction decoder. So this work is supported by the Wallenberg Center for Quantum Technology, and our device is fabricated in cooperation with VTT from Finland. So all right, so this is the outline of my talk. I will divide it up to two parts. The first part will introduce a few techniques we have developed to improve readout fidelity. And the second part is using this extra information we have from a good readout to improve the decoder of a quantum error correction thing. And let's dive right in. So first, I will quickly introduce um, the principles to design a readout circuit and just give a quick um, concept so we have uh, we in the same, on, on the same page. And basically, we have a qubit directly coupled to a readout resonator through a direct capacitance. And the resonator is coupled to the outside world with a, a coupling strand kappa here. And this kappa is part of the factor that determines our readout speed and also determines how the qubit sees the outside environment. So it imposes a limit on the T1 of our qubit as a T1 Purcell limit. So basically, in this very conventional scheme, we're trading readout speed for qubit lifetime all the time. And consider a typical set of parameters. If you want to achieve a fast readout at, say, below 100 nanoseconds, then the qubit lifetime will be reduced to about 5 microseconds, which is not ideal. Then people have come up with a scheme uh, called a Purcell filter, which is a, basically another coplanar waveguide that coupled to the res readout resonator through a smaller capacitance J here. And this gives us a lot of parameters that we can play with, and that also modify the qubit environment accordingly. And then by choosing a correct set of parameters, we can also protect the qubit lifetime as well as achieving a fast readout. Then with these equations and another set of typical parameters, we can able to achieve a less than 100 nanosecond of readout time while still keep the Q1 Purcell limit on the qubit to be above 1,000 microsecond. So then with the device we have developed here, we have achieved a readout duration of 140 nanoseconds that brings us closer to what have, uh, state of art people have done uh, in the past. And then here's the device of our um, Purcell filter testing chip. We have three fixed frequency transmount qubits, each of them coupled to a dedicated readout resonator, and all three of them are coupled to the same Purcell filter that's embedded in the feed line, defined by the two input-output capacitor here. And with this chip, we are able to achieve a readout duration of 140 nanoseconds, as I said before. And this is done without using any quantum limited parametric amplifier. And then we'll look into the details how we can explore the hinge arrows of the transmount to improve our qubit readout. First, let's characterize our chip. 
we measure the S21 parameter as a function of frequency, and our qubits lies around 5.4 gigahertz, and our resonances are around 6.6 gigahertz. The green profile here is the common Purcell filter on our chip. Then let's zoom in on the middle resonator here, and here is the state-dependent response of the second resonator when the second qubit is at 0, 1, 2, and 3 state. So we can use this information to determine the optimal readout frequency later on. Then we want to characterize the behavior of the high energy levels. Basically, we do this with a T1-like experiment, prepare the qubit in 0, 1, 2, and 3 state, wait for a certain amount of time, and then measure the population. To do the, um, we do this to in order to extract all these sequential decay rate from, um, from each energy levels, and we expect the two photon or three photon transition from these high level back to ground should be negligible. So this is our measurement result. This is the zero state population as a function of delay time. And if we, the qubit is prepared in zero, one, two, and three state. So if, if, if qubit is at, in one state, then similar to the T1 experiment we usually do, the interesting part shows up when the qubits go up to high energy levels. And if we zoom in on the shorter time scale, it seems that the qubits no longer experience a, non, a exponential decay. And this can give us an advantage in discriminating uh, state between zero and non-zero state. We believe that with these techniques, we can achieve greater than 99% readout fidelity without using any parameter amplifiers just by reducing the, delay, the decay error during the readout. Here is our simple readout calibration procedure. Basically, we'll prepare the qubit in zero and one state, and we have inserted another pi 1, 2, and pi 2, 3 pulse here between the state preparation and the readout pulse to transfer the one state population up to three state. And this is called the shelving techniques. And we all can also include a pre-selection protocol in the beginning of our sequence to filter out all the similar populations and remove the systematic errors in our measurement. Then we can choose the optimal readout frequency. To do this, we have to look into the IQ plane of our S21 measurement. You look here and find the the frequency where zero and one state are maximally separated in this IQ plane. And at this frequency, all these hinge levels are indistinguishable from each other. So if a decay happens from two to one during readout, it won't affect our assignment fidelity. And only a de another error, another de decay from one to zero will contribute to the error. So we lump everything here at hinge level to be the not zero state. And then here shows the single shot without result for a zero and not zero state. We can also project everything onto a single axis here and, and translate into a 1D histogram. We can fit a Gaussian to the histogram and extract that our ideal fidelity, which is only counting the overlap error here, amounts to 99.95%. And if you're counting all the error, including decay and the remaining uh, without induced uh, transitions, it's amount to 99.5% assignment fidelity. We repeat this measurement on all three qubits and measure them simultaneously and find out that we can reduce the overall error rate by around 57% on average with these shelving techniques. Then I'll move on to talking about the two-tone readout pulse. The motivation is that since in this configuration we can only distinguish zero and not zero state, but the two-state population is still interesting when we want to look at the leakage performance of our circuit or gate calibration. So then we can, without sacrificing S and SNR, we can place another secondary readout tone near the frequency where one and two state population, are, when one, one and two state response are maximally separated on IQ plane. So we believe by combining these two tones together, we can achieve better than using a single tone. Here is the two-tone readout pulse scheme. Basically, we combine these two tones into a single pulse with the frequency multiplexing techniques we have um, available. And then we can transfer the one state population again to three states through these pi 1, 2, and pi 2, 3 pulses. And in this case, we'll use the two state as a buffer. Then we can still need to discriminate these joint results. So for now, since we have uh, two simultaneous results coming back for each, each of the shot, we can need to find, um, we can find that they can agree on a single initial state most of the time, but for some time that they can disagree, we count them those as an overlap error, and we can discard them in post-selection. These amount to 0.5% of the total shot we measured. 
And another method we can use is by take the IQ component of the role measurement data and combine it into a full element, element vector and feed this into a small but very effective feed-forward neural network. It's got two hidden layers, and it's taking like 10 minutes to train. And the output will be your probability for the qubit to initially at 0, 1, and 2 state. So for this, with the help of a machine learning algorithm and the two-tone without pulse, we're able to achieve a three-state assignment fidelity of 96.9%. And it's a huge improvement over the previous tone with only a single tone, which is 94.9%. And here is the summary of the first part of the talk. Basically, we had demonstrated two methods, uh, very simple techniques that we can introduce to our uh, current devices to improve our readout performance. And this is what we published earlier this year. So the next part, we have to switch gear a bit, look into how we can use this extra information to help the effort in quantum error correction. So for this, we'll quickly introduce a concept of repetition code. And this example of dissonant five repetition code with nine physical qubits is what we can realize in our physical device. And for each of the ancilla, we perform a simple Z parity check between the two neighboring data qubits, and we measure and reset ancilla qubits at the end of this, uh, each detection cycle. Next, we need to construct a decoder graph with this circuit and it looks like this. So I have two components, one is called the node here, and there's edges joining each node. So the node here represents the, each detection we made. So each until a measurement result, we're going to nodes. And the weights uh, defining these edges is represent, uh, determined by the error on the data qubits that we have prior knowledge on. So this is one layer of the decoder graph. Also expanded in this direction, which is called space-like dimension, by going longer in distance. And we can go also repeat our detection cycle, so we build more in the horizontal direction, and this will call like time-like edges, or time-like weights. And these weights that's joining these two, the same nodes across different layers is represent, um, represents the arrows in our readout. And this is something we can play around. So then we'll talk about how we include the soft information from the readouts into our decoder graph and make it better. So we have this already available at our hands. Remember, we have the IQ components of all our measurements, the MQB result as a single vector. We have, maybe now we have a, need a better and larger feedful neural network to take all in this input, and it will still give us the probability for the qubit to add a zero, one, or two state separately. And then we have this piece of information, and we can extract two bits of measurement. First is the still the hard information, so we look at what's the most probable state that qubit can be in. So this going to still going to our uh, nodes here, and the solid information is how confident we are in this uh, this particular shot of measurement. This going to the time lag weights here, and this weights can be individually modified depending on the shots you made here. So this is you can update these uh, time lag weights for each cycle of measurement. So then we simulate our decoder with a phenological uh, noise model, which contains bit flip error and readout overlap error. And this plotted the logical error rate as a function of physical error rate. And we simulate from code distance 13 to 37. And we find the threshold by looking at the intersection of these curves. This gives us a 10.3% um, in threshold. So that's our baseline. We tested our uh, coder by with the soft information incorporated, and this shows an improvement to 12.4% in threshold and uh, on average 24% better than the baseline. So this is a good sign that putting more information in the decoder can help it a lot. Then we want to tackle the issue of ancillary leakage. It's the dominant source of error and detrimental to code performance, as we heard many times in this conference, and people are very interested. So we focusing on a small case where leakage on the cella caused by the non-ideal two qubit gate happening there between the data qubits and ancilla qubits. So if ever we want to transfer one one state to two zero state to implement a C phase gate. So that an leakage happening on the ancilla will erase the information on your data qubits. So this become a ground at zero. And depending on which ancilla has the leakage, it also affects either just one ancilla or two ancilla simultaneously. 
So our simple mitigation technique will be to keep the source information because it's an uh, indication of how confident you are in this particular short -term measurement, but use the, the state assignment of the next detection cycle, the same node, then bring it forward in time so we correct all the error to make in the error detection. So then we compare these two decoders again. The first time, the first one doesn't have any ability to distinguish the leakage. So any two state it happens, it will read out as either zero or one randomly. This gave us a threshold of 9.4%. And the second one we tested the solid formation, um, solid formation into the timelike weights as well as update the nodes accordingly when we detect leakage. And this gave us an improved threshold back again to around 12%. And this is improvement over around 25% by just including the soft information and instead leakage information. So this investigation is really inspiring to us because it makes us rethink readout as not just a single component, but a like integral part in any larger system. So this gives us more opportunity to optimize readout depending on the context. So in this case, we can just put more information we already have into the decoder and enhance the code performance. So then in summary, we have demonstrated a few um, techniques that are robust and straightforward implement to improve your readout performance, as well as looking into the future of how you can use uh, more information from readout to boost our error correction performance. And in the future, we want more effort in the experimental side to utilize the parameter amplifier we have developed in-house to see how far we can push the readout for that even further. We want to integrate all the, any um, uh, possible re reset protocols to clean all the high levels population after the readout. And we, if everything's going well, then we uh, will implement er experimental quantum er error correction scheme to test our simulation and validate them. All right, so that's the end of my talk. A great thank to everyone in Chalmers you know, to make this happen, as well as collaborator in VTT, and thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Liang Yu, for his very wonderful, for his wonderful talk with his very uh, promising results and impressive results on the readout. Please, the floor is open for question. Hi, great talk. Um, could you comment on the uh, measurement-induced crosstalk, or the, rather the impact on the non-measured qubits from your measurement pulse? Yes, we actually have measured them in our um, later investigation. So we measured basically the decoherence on that qubit when we measure the one that's not targeted. And it does uh, indicate that when coming per cell filter may have issue with a uh, cost dog issue. And we believe that by using techniques like qubit cloaking, when we have quadrature terms in our uh, readout pulse, engineer it better, reduce the shape, um, reshape the readout pulse, this can be reduced just from the software side. Thanks, over up there. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering if uh, uh, applying the primary tone and secondary tone at the same time, uh, wouldn't it make difference if, because um, prime, uh, secondary tone is for higher energy levels, I believe, so the relaxation happens faster in that. So do you apply both the readout tones at the same time? Because uh, for secondary tone, I think the uh, relaxation would be faster? Um, we still apply it at the same time. The high energy state relaxation doesn't really matter because when it happens, it doesn't affect our discrimination error. So um, we are lumped all these high energy states together, so the decay happened between them that won't affect our readout result. Only if one happens to cross our boundary here. So maybe I will indicate um, someone here. Yes, so if the K happened here to here, which is very fast, it won't affect the result. But only if the K happened here to here will affect it. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, I was wondering, um, you're showing here very nicely how you're getting the results out. Um, but if you have a single tone, you can typically get optimal weights by measuring the time trace for the zero state average and the one state average are getting the difference. Is there a similar analytical procedure to get your analytical your integration weights out? Or do you always need to get a neural net to find these coefficients? Um, I didn't get the question clearly, so... Uh, maybe I can 
Um, when you're doing a regular um, measurement with only one tone, uh, the standard way to set your integration weights is to use a square single sidepan demodulation. And you can do slightly better by doing optimal weight, which you can acquire by measuring the transient for the zero state and then the transient for the one state and taking the difference that will look similar to your square but slightly different. Now my question is, is there or do you think there is a similar procedure to find the optimal integration weights uh, in this case or is the only way to throw it into a black box neural net and that's the best we can do? Of course, we always want to push it further and matching, the matching filters is of course a good way to improve your performance. Um, I, well, we personally haven't tried implemented using the two-tone, um, but it's a good direction to try you know, in the future. And neural network itself, unless it's training on the time trace data, it cannot capture this weight. And training on time trace data is very resource consuming as um, done by our collaborator. So we are still thinking about it. The lightweight of the network is what make it better for scalability in this term. So we would like to try uh, integration ways on the hardware side and not on the software side. Yeah. OK. So thanks. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the discussion. Let's thank Liang Yu again for this very interesting talk. And And let's welcome our next speaker on the stage, and that's Eli Levinson Falk from USC, and uh, talking about creating on demand loss with superconducting qubits. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you, and uh, thanks everybody for continuing to pay attention later in the afternoon. Uh, I need to start by acknowledging all the people who contributed to this work, most notably uh, my former student, Haimong, who's now at uh, IBM, current student, Vivek. They've both done incredible work here. Um, now, I'm going to skip the description of dispersive readout since we've just heard a lot about it and instead say that, you know, readout is great and all, but it can cause problems. Um, this is our typical, uh, you know, dispersive Hamiltonian here. We have this dispersive term. We typically say that the qubit state modifies the cavity frequency, and that's how we do a readout. But you could just as easily just group terms differently and say that the cavity state is modulating the qubit frequency. Now, that's an issue because there might be photons in your cavity when you didn't want there to be them. And that photon number can fluctuate. So this could happen either because there was some thermal excitation of your uh, cavity. You know, it's hard to get these things cold. Uh, it could also just happen because you did a readout some time ago and the cavity hasn't fully relaxed back to its ground state yet. So these photons fluctuating in the cavity cause qubit frequency noise and cause dephasing. Alternately, you can just say these photons are measuring the qubit, and a measurement is going to collapse in these superposition. That's dephasing. <clears throat> now, the temperatures in these cavities are typically not that close to the fridge temperature. Often, if, unless you work kind of hard, you'll find it's closer to 100 millikelvin than to 10 millikelvin. Um, and this is basically the fault of the attenuators that you have. Used to be they were always these stainless steel attenuators with plastic um, components. We've gotten better at it since then. Now we've got these nice uh, copper attenuator, copper housings with uh, crystalline components. That makes things better. But it's still very, very hard to get stuff cold. You know, getting photons cold, getting electrons cold is hard. However, even if you solve that problem, even if you have perfect attenuators, everything's perfectly at the fridge temperature, you're still gonna need fast reset. Let's say you're trying to do something like the surface code. You're gonna need thousands of physical operations per logical operation, and you have to reset the system after every one, otherwise you're gonna get this decoherence. Now, if it's the qubit you're trying to reset, um, and you try to just wait for it to decay, that might take hundreds of microseconds. You know, this is the, the dirty uh, downside of all these improvements in T1, is that they make everything take a long time. Um, you know, the cavity relaxes faster, but it can still take several microseconds, and these are wait times that can really affect you. Now, really what we want to do is just get back to the ground state of the system, and this is just removing entropy. And there's really only two possible ways to remove entropy from a system. Um, one is we can do this active feedback. This is what the approach that most people take. So you measure, for instance, the qubit state. If you notice it's in the excited state, you do a pi pulse, and you kick it back to the ground state. This is an information-based approach. This is really Maxwell's demon. 
because what you're doing is you're looking at the state of the system and then doing a very gentle control to just nudge it towards the statistical configuration that you want. And it works pretty well, but it does have some issues. It's you know, relatively slow. These feedback loops can take several microseconds. Um, it's a little difficult because the, uh, you, know, you have to have fast FPGAs, you have to have very good readout. Uh, everything has to stay pretty well calibrated. So you can introduce error, and even you know, if everything there is perfect, you still can't really, for instance, correct a thermal state of the cavity. That's going to fluctuate too quickly. The only other thing you could do is just hook your system up to something cold and let heat flow. And this is a dissipation-based approach. That's the only other way to remove entropy from a system. Well, the problem with dissipation is that it's loss. And if it's always on, then it's either going to cause decoherence if it's affecting a qubit, or it's just going to ruin your readout SNR if it's affecting your readout cavity. And like I said, you know, getting the thing cold in the first place is hard. So the way we're going to try to solve this issue is have on-demand dissipation that we can turn on and off and do it via a quantum refrigeration process that's not going to require such a low, low temperature. So we're going to take sort of a typical cavity QED system. Um, you know, we've got a readout cavity and just an ordinary qubit. Here it's a transmon. And then we'll couple it to this device we call a dissipator. Now this is really just a tunable transmon or a parametric coupler that is deliberately made lossy by coupling it to some external source of loss. And the, in our case, it's just a 50 ohm termination. The only thing this has to do is be lossy and be cold. And if all you want something to do is be lossy, it's a lot easier to get it to be cold. Now, looking just at the cavity and the dissipator, treating the dissipator as a qubit, we get this sort of charge-charge interaction between them. If you modulate the flux through the dissipator, you'll introduce this sigma z type drive, you know, a parametric drive. If you do that at the detuning frequency between the dissipator and the cavity, you'll swap interactions back and forth between them. So let's say we started with n plus one photons in the cavity and the dissipator in the ground state. We turn on the modulation. We swap that photon into the dissipator. We swap one photon in the dissipator. But the dissipator is lossy, so it immediately drops down to its ground state again, and we've removed one photon from the system. If we just continuously drive, it'll just fall all the way down the ladder. This is a way to remove photons from a readout cavity. Uh, our target system could instead be a qubit instead of a cavity. That would just bring the qubit to its ground state. But also, we can just turn this on all the time on a cavity. We can just turn this on whenever we're not doing a measurement. And it will just keep the cavity in its ground state, because if it ever picks up a photon, that photon will swap over into the dissipator and immediately be emitted. Now, I want to note that this is distinct from just taking our target system and putting it in thermal contact with a bath. If we were to do that, these things would come into a thermal equilibrium at the bath temperature. So we would be limited by the temperature of our bath. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking our dissipator, putting that in contact with the bath. Those go into thermal equilibrium. But then the target system gets a coherent swapping with the dissipator because we put work in. We put our coherent drive in. So this is a refrigerator. You know, I, I drew this like an intro to thermodynamics um, you know, state diagram, and that's really what it is. And in fact, what happens is you get an uh, equilibrium not of the temperature, but of the number of excitations. The number of excitations in your target and your dissipator becomes the same. And given the dissipator loss is so much more uh, strong, everything just sort of goes to whatever the dissipator number of excitations is, which is set by the dissipator's temperature. And so the cavity temperature, the target temperature, can be colder than the dissipator temperature if it's at a lower frequency. Now, the actual device looks like this. We've got an ordinary lambda over two readout cavity. Here, just an ordinary logical qubit. We're just going to use this to characterize how well this thing is working. This is the dissipator. So it's a tunable transmon parametric coupler. You can see it's a very, very small capacitor there, just putting it at high frequency. We've got a fast flux line to do our parametric drives. Over here, we're going to attach a 50 ohm termination. So that provides our loss. 
And then this is a Purcell filter, just basically making sure that nothing else can really see the 50 ohm termination unless we're doing this parametric draft. <clears throat> so the first characterization is just to look to see if we can reset the cavity quickly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna populate the cavity with photons by doing an ordinary readout pulse. Then we'll do a reset operation by driving the fast flux line for some variable length of time, and then just listen and see what comes out. So on the right here, first I'm just showing if we don't do the fast flux drive, if we just let the cavity ring down by coupling to the external feed line, it rings down about 850 nanoseconds or so, which is just the design parameters that we have. When we drive strongly, we can get it to ring down in about 80 nanoseconds. And in fact, this was just sort of like the bias point where the data happened to you know, be taken with especially good SNR. My students have some other data where they got it down below 50. So we're able to ring down the cavity much faster, but this doesn't really prove that we're ringing it down to its ground state. We're just ringing it down to something. So let's see what state we're actually ringing it down to. And we're gonna use that logical qubit as a sensor here now. So again, we're gonna populate the cavity with photons. Then we'll do a reset operation. In this case, it's going to be for a fixed length of time. It's gonna be for one microsecond. Then we'll do a qubit coherence measurement. Uh, and I've drawn it here as Ramsey, but actually we ended up doing echo most of the time. And read out the qubit. In the background, if we don't populate the cavity and don't do the reset, we just do an ordinary echo measurement, we got a T2 echo of about 5.6 microseconds. Not the best for reasons I'll get into later. If we populate the cavity, wait one microsecond, but don't do any sort of reset operation, just a short wait, and then measure coherence, we get about 0.6 microseconds or so, and I'm kind of waving my hands there because you can see the fit isn't very good, uh, basically because as the cavity photon number decays, the decoherence rate also changes, so it's not even an exponential process. Um, however, I, I feel confident saying it's short. You know, this is, this, that's a crappy qubit right there. When we turn on the fast flux drive, do this one microsecond reset pulse, we recover our initial value. It's uh, 5.4 microseconds here. Basically, the, the background value will you know, vary by plus minus a microsecond or so. Uh, you know, we were always able to hit the same thing. So we are able to sort of reset the cavity and recover our original qubit coherence. Now, that's getting back to how things were you know, after a readout. What about uh, trying to actually do this refrigeration? What about trying to cool it? So in this case, again, we're gonna use the qubit as a sensor. We're gonna measure the coherence um, while, in this case, driving the cavity weakly during the free evolution. This is to sort of like simulate there being a lot of thermal photons in the cavity. And then we'll also turn on this fast flux drive to cool the cavity at the same time. So again, if we don't have any of these extra drives, the Bayer T2 is 5.6 microseconds. If we just turn on the cavity drive, but no cooling, so we've got a lot of photons in there, um, it doesn't even look like an echo because it turns out there's so many photons in there that our pi pulse was just horribly miscalibrated. Um, and so, you know, take that exact number with a grain of salt, but I can say that that is a very, very short-lived qubit. You know, certainly much less than a microsecond turn the cooling pulse back on, and now we went back above where we were. And so we saw that and said, well, what if we don't make it worse on purpose? So we drive the cooling, but don't deliberately put extra photons into the cavity, and we got up to 8.8 .8 microseconds. So we were preserving the qubit coherence against environmental noise. Now this qubit was designed specifically to be extra sensitive to any photons in the cavity, so it's maybe not so surprising that um, we were able to do a better job by cooling the cavity. I will say we weren't expecting quite so much noise. We, we were expecting you know, maybe a factor of five better than that or so. So we probably need to do a better job filtering and shielding in our uh, setup. Now I will say I'm quite confident that the remaining sources of dephasing at that level have nothing to do with photons in the cavity. They're everything to do with uh, limitations of our fabrication. So we're now gonna start optimizing this device, just like tuning the couplings and the loss rate, um, fixing these fab issues. Uh, side note, 
if anyone is about to buy an evaporator with an ion mill, do not get an end haul ion mill. It is a machine whose only job is to take little bits of iron out of your uh, chamber and put them into your superconducting film, and that causes problems. Um, so instead, we're gonna make this optimized design and then go to the nice people at MIT and Lincoln Lab and have their foundry make it for us. Um, we've been trying to use this for qubit reset, and we can actually get the qubit to reset, but it's also punching out sometimes. Uh, we think, again, this is just an effect of there being too much noise and probably causing us to drive some, some unwanted transitions, but we're not fully sure about that. If anyone has any ideas, please come talk to me. <laughs> um, we should be able to get it to happen within a microsecond or two, though. Um, and just by driving that Purcell filter mode um, with you know, carefully tuned drives, we should actually be able to cool to non-trivial states, not just the ground state, not, you know, the zero photon state, but some other non-classical state. So we want to explore that. So as always, I have to make a plug. My lab is always hiring. My department is hiring, and I'm on the search committee. So postdocs out there, please come talk to me. And Qbytes is always looking for authors. So thank you for your attention. Take questions. Thanks. Thanks for this very interesting talk. Please, questions. So we don't have a, a thermometer on it. I will say, if anything in the fridge is well thermalized, it's probably that. Because this is one of these um, terminations from quantum microwave, where it's basically just a, a metal pin sticking into a big chunk of echosorb um, and wrapped in a copper housing. And that copper housing is directly bolted to like an extremely thick copper strap that's bolted to the fridge plate. So maybe it's hotter than the fridge, but it really shouldn't be. Uh, great talk. I have a question about your uh, cool non-trivial state idea, the cooling the non-trivial state. Yeah. Um, are you thinking, how do you plan to implement the optical nonlinearity? Is it through the dissipation, or do you plan on doing like nonlinear drives on the resonator? So, uh, I mean, there, there is sort of, an enormous parameter space of what you can do, and we haven't really settled on anything. I mean, the simplest one is, uh, you know, th this, uh, this cooling drive is frequency selective. Um, so we can make it a little bit more frequency selective just by turning down the loss rate, and then rely on the induced nonlinearity of the cavity to just say that, like, we're only going to be dissipating transitions in a certain range of photon numbers. And then if we drive the cavity, we'll sort of populate everything else. Um, that's one, I, I think that's actually been demonstrated before um, using a different approach, but you can also do sidebands that will, you know, preferentially add or remove photons. The holy grail that I really want to figure out, and I know in my bones that it's possible, but I don't know how, um, is to dissipate only odd photon numbers. <laughs> because then you could stabilize a cat code autonomously. Okay, Miko? Yeah, thanks. Uh, can you comment on the photon number or the temperature of the, uh, your resonator that you were then, like before cooling, with cooling? Um... Yeah, so uh, before cooling, if we say that sort of everything, all, all, the, all the T2 was due to photons in the cavity, uh, it's about 0.3, which is very high, um, and so leads me to believe that we have some, some major noise sources in here, which is surprising because we have other qubits um, in the same fridge with T2s of like 150 microseconds. Um, after cooling, uh, we're actually not able to put as strict of a bound on it after cooling as we are before. Um, after cooling, we can only say it's less than one. And the reason for that is that this cooling, you know, removes photons, but it also greatly increases kappa um, the, you know, the loss rate, and the loss rate gets so much larger than the dispersive shift that the effect of a single photon becomes smaller. So not only do we remove photons, but we become less sensitive to every photon. Um, we're currently fabbing a device that's sort of designed for photon number counting, so we can put much more strict bounds on this. Um, at the moment, you know, I can't say it's that good, but I can say that 
when we do the strong cooling drive and then add cavity drives back in, we actually have to drive pretty hard before we notice anything. And so just sort of based on calculations of roughly how many photons we would have to add for it to see like that, um, it kind of looks like uh, we're like well, well below single photon, but we can't say stricter than that how low we are. Is one more question I can take? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, did you observe any effects on the signal to noise ratio when you use this cooling tone, or that leaves? Well, so that's the wonderful thing is that we turn the we turn it off as soon as we do a measurement, um, okay. and th that's really crucial. Uh, if you leave it on, your signal to noise ratio. It's not zero, but it's very small, um, because you're taking all the photons in the cavity and dissipating them before they can get back out to your feed line. Um, <clears throat> I will say uh, we are, we probably need to like to tone this thing back a little bit. Uh, one thing we can do is turn on the cooling and then drive the cavity as hard as we can, like even using amplifiers at room temperature, and we can't even punch out the qubit anymore because um, we just cannot get enough photons in there. Uh, so it probably doesn't need to be that strong. <laughs> okay, so let's thank Eli and let's thank all the speakers of this session. <laughs> thank you for listening and then we make still a 10 minutes break and let's meet at quarter to five uh, here for the second part of this high fidelity uh, Qubit uh, reset and readout and the control session. Thanks.
think I will do an announcement afterwards so you can hand over at the last moment that okay. I explain where the bus is leaving. Good. Uh, it's already on. It's already on. If you go on there, they will turn you up. Ah, okay, I go up there. And the next slide deck will be just the next slide will be Yoshiki, so yeah. you just need to press next. Good. Okay. As the last uh, people filter in, thanks for sticking around for the last session of the day. I know it's been a long day. Not long before we're all going to Hofbau Keller, so that should be, uh, should be fun. So we have uh, three talks coming up, and then uh, we're all done for the day. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, the first speaker on stage, Yoshiku, uh, and who will tell us about uh, Yoshiki, sorry, thermal noise tolerant dispersive readout of a superconducting qubit using a nonlinear per cell filter. So very good follow-up talk. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Yoshiki Sunada. I'm currently a postdoc at Aalto University in Finland, but uh, today I'll talk about my work that I did in, with my previous colleagues at the University of Tokyo and Riken. And what we did basically is that we uh, built a nonlinear filter that protects the qubit from, from the noise, uh, the, the T2 of the qubit from the noise. So there's a nice connection uh, from the last talk before the break. But, uh, Keep in mind that this is a filter, but it, it works for the T2 and not the T1. And this is what I'm proud of. Like, I, I don't think any other filter does this. It's exciting. So uh, let's go on. Um, OK, the starting point uh, of this work was uh, this question. Uh, can we keep going with this trend of the coherence time T2 getting longer and longer and readout getting better and better? And I think you've seen this, this figure so many, oh, many times. It's, the T2 has been improving uh, since uh, 2001. But the, this, this figure is new. This one's a very nice figure in this preprint. Uh, it shows that the error, readout error and the readout time has been reducing uh, in the recent years. So uh, can we keep going with this trend? And uh, we, unfortunately, we came to believe that the answer is no if we keep relying on a simple dispersive readout with linear filters. And the reason is uh, the dephasing induced by the residual noise photons in the readout resonator. And I'll try to uh, do a better job of uh, introducing this uh, because the last talk was excellent. Uh, OK, oh, I need to mention this. So there was a poster by one of my uh, the co-authors here on this work, uh, and he came right here. So uh, we're, our group is really trying to, to push in this direction, uh, uh, high fidelity, fast readout, and we want to know if we can keep going. All right, so let me step back and talk about uh, the fact that the readout resonator introduces decoherence channels. We all know, I think, by now uh, we read out a qubit by dispersively coupling a readout resonator, but that introduces uh, decoherence channels. And the first one, the most prominent one, is the energy relaxation through the readout resonator. And that has a very uh, established, well-established solution, which is to insert a filter here. All right, but this doesn't help us in terms of the dephasing, uh, dephasing induced by the noise photons in the readout resonator, which is just uh, the photon number fluctuation of the readout resonator causing this uh, energy level difference to fluctuate. So the conventional solution to this uh, has been to, uh, to do a better job of cooling uh, microwave attenuators, or uh, quant a quantum refrigerator is something that I should have included here. But uh, in the end, you need to uh, dissipate the heat. So that's getting more and more difficult because the electron-phonon coupling diminishes at low temperature as t to the power of 5. So diminishes very quickly. So yeah, so it's the problem. So what we decided to do is to accept that there will always be some thermal noise and ask this question, can we make the device noise tolerant? So to think about this in a quantitative way, uh, let me define a figure of merit uh, that we call the dynamic range of the dephasing rate. And that's the ratio between the measurement-induced de measurement dephasing rate, 
while you're doing a readout, readout and, uh, uh, and the dephasing rate due to residual noise photons when you're not doing a readout. So uh, if you see here, so the measurement induced dephasing rate is equal to the maximum measurement rate. So that means that this figure of merit is uh, roughly corresponds to how many readouts you can perform in, within the T2 of the qubit. And you can do a math here in the case of uh, linear for cell filter because there are nice formulas for these quantities where um, kappa effective is the effective line width of the readout resonator and chi QC is the dispersive shift between the qubit and the readout resonator. And this n mes is the number of photons that you put in the readout resonator for readout, and this end noise is the number of photons that, that you don't want to put, but this, it's a, there's a residual noise photons in the, in the resonator. And if you take a ratio between these two formulas, you get this nice equation. So what this says is the dynamic range of the dephasing rate is equal to uh, twice the dynamic range of the photon number in the resonator. And this is a huge problem because I, I don't think this dynamic range of, of the photon number can be sustainably increased. So uh, the upper bound comes from this uh, photon number of the, during the readout. I, usually we use like 10 or maybe like a few photons in the resonator for a readout because if you, if you put too, much too many photons in the resonator, you break this dispersive Hamiltonian. But like, there have been works like uh, by Professor Johannes Fink that he put like a thousand photons, it was fine, but uh, that's more like an exception. But uh, we, we can't certainly go like a thousand and then uh, 10,000, 100,000, uh, we can't scale it exponentially. And the lower bound uh, here is the noise photon number and this is, reducing this is also difficult because of the reasons I talked about and also in the last talk uh, was on this. So we need to somehow break this equality. And how do we do it? Well, there's already a solution number one, which, was, uh, which is a very recent work. Uh, and it, what they do is uh, they manually increase uh, chi QC, uh, the dispersive shift during readout. But this requires a fast flux line uh, to, uh, and a flux tunable qubit. So, what we did was to use a nonlinear linear cell filter that automatically adjusts the, uh, the line width of the readout resonator when a readout pulse is applied. So this is similar in spirit to uh, a group, uh, the work uh, done in our group uh, called Josephson Quantum Filter that enhances the T1 of the qubit by using a filter that saturates when you apply a pi pulse. So, how does it work? How does a nonlinear for cell filter work exactly? So uh, it's basically a bandfast filter with care nonlinearity. What that means is that uh, the passband of the filter shifts when you apply any signal onto it. Uh, so what we want is that the, if there is just noise in the readout waveguide, we want the filter and transmission to be large. But when, you, when we apply a readout pulse, we want the, the, resonate, the filter to shift and the transmission to decrease. Why that's good is that uh, because the sensitivity to input field in the readout waveguide in terms of the dephasing rate per, per uh, number of photons in the resonator, this has this kind of dependence on the resonator line width. So if the line width of the resonator is large when, you're, when there's just noise, uh, the, the the qubit is not sensitive to this noise, so that's good. But when you apply a readout, so during a readout, you can match this effective line with, with the, with the um, dispersive shift, and that's the optimal condition for performing a readout. Okay, here's uh, what our device actually looks. So here's a data qubit, a transmon, a readout resonator with an intrinsic for cell filter, and a nonlinear filter. Uh, Right here, qubit, uh, readout resonator, nonlinear filter. And we uh, apply pi pulses here and readout pulse here. Uh, if you zoom in to the nonlinear filter, you can see that uh, it's a lambda over four resonator uh, interrupted by a squid, which gives it that, uh, the nonlinearity that we need. 
And if you look here, the anharmonicity of the filter is almost as large as uh, that of a uh, transmond, but uh, the external line width is also large, so that makes, which makes this uh, more like a nonlinear resonator rather than a transmond qubit. So we use this squid to tune the filter, so you can see here. So blue line is the readout resonator, and this, 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 uh, these circles are the filter. So what we want is to match the frequency of the filter to the readout resonator. But uh, I'll show in the next slide that this precise tuning is not really necessary. So in the future, we can replace this squid with a single junction with maybe some uh, laser annealing, and it will be fine. So uh, with this device, first we evaluated the uh, noise sensitivity. And how we did that is that we measured the T2 echo uh, of the qubit while injecting artificial noise uh, in, into, the, into the readout waveguide. And when we did that, we measured this kind of dependence. So this is plotting the noise sensitivity in terms of uh, the dephasing rate per noise power. So as we expect uh, this when the filter is resonant with the readout resonator, uh, the device is least sensitive to noise because this effective line width of the readout resonator is much larger than the uh, dispersive shift. And you can also see that even if the filter is misaligned by about 100 megahertz, it's fine, it still works. But if, you, if the, the filter is uh, too far detuned, the, there's a point where uh, the device becomes most sensitive to noise, and that's where the effective line width is equal to the, to the uh, dispersive shift. But this is also where, uh, for a linear filter, this is where the readout is most efficient. So we can take the ratio of this, this point here and this point and say that uh, we enhance the noise tolerance by a factor of three. And we also measured the T2 echo without the artificial noise, and we saw that because of our unimpressive T1, the, the T2 echo is not, like this enhancement is not the factor of three, but it, we can still see it. And we found that the, this is a good way to actually measure the level of noise in your system. So we, we did this fitting and found that the, the, the level of noise in our system is actually really good, like close to the state of the art, without like special filters. So that's part of the reason why this is not like as impressive as this, this curve. It's fine. Uh, next, we, uh, we need to uh, demonstrate that we can do a good readout with this. So we optimized the readout pulse using this kind of pulse sequence. We prepared the G state or an E state and uh, applied the readout tone with different frequencies and amplitude. And we were optimizing this, and we found out uh, as we were doing it that we can actually take advantage of the bifurcation of the nonlinear filter. And uh, bifurcation, if, in case you don't know, is uh, what happens when you uh, drive a nonlinear resonator. Uh, so uh, when you drive it strongly, there's uh, two possible steady states that can happen. And in the early days, this has been used to uh, enhance the readout signal. And we saw something similar uh, here in our device. So this is the phase spectrum of, uh, of the reflection coefficient of the, uh, the filter for G state and E state. And as we increase the, the, the amplitude of the readout pulse, we see this uh, jump in the phase. So this is, and we also compared it to a classical model of a duffing oscillator, and it's, uh, I describe it it's a fairly good description, I think. There's, there's some deviation here, but so, so there's an, definitely some effect of bifurcation. And that's good because we can get a very good separation of the G signal from the E signal. And we can see that in here. So this is the measurement rate that we calculated from this data. And the measurement rate would be linear to the square of the amplitude in the case of a linear, linear filter. But so this is the dashed line, is the case of a linear filter, but our measurement is uh, nine times enhanced compared to that. So this was a su surprise to us because we only expected a factor of three improvement based on the measurement of the, in the pr previous slide of the sensitivity to noise, but we got a factor of nine. But uh, on this slide, there's so, so much uh, fun physics going on because we actually have to think about the quantum noise when we calculate the measurement rate. And, uh, and, the, and the bifurcation can be useful for latching readout. So, so there's 
so much more uh, fun things we can do with this. But uh, uh, for this talk, uh, it seems to work fine. So I just went on with uh, a faster readout. I just put like a much shorter uh, readout pulse, 200 nanoseconds. And it was just enough to do a readout with just a hemp amp amplifier. And we got like a 98% readout fidelity and also 98% uh, QND fidelity. But if we also use a Josephson parametric amplifier, we could, use, we could do a 40 nanosecond readout pulse and get like a 99.4% fidelity. That's all good. Uh, second to last slide. We want to quickly show you that the filter is uh, effective even, uh, even when we apply a con control pulse. So what we were worried about was that because pipe pulses are much stronger than the readout pulses, it might maybe uh, act on the nonlinear filter and shift it a little bit uh, so that uh, the noise tolerance is, uh, is weakened. But it turned out that this, this readout resonator is doing a good job of uh, filtering out the pipes from the filter. And so we can see that we added uh, some noise and measured T1 and T2 and calculated the co coherence limit and compared it with uh, randomized benchmarking, and the, these markers are practically on top of each other. So we, we are achieving coherence-limited gate fidelities. Well, that's very good. Conclusion. Uh, we proposed and demonstrated the nonlinear Purcell filter, which overcomes the limit on readout performance versus T2 in the presence of residual noise photons. Uh, this can apply to any type of qubits that can be dispersively read out. It's robust to filter frequency variation, no need for additional control signal, so it's compatible with uh, large-scale integration. Uh, we are, so this is our first device, so we're now, now working on a numerical model and uh, optimizing the filter parameters. And, uh, hopefully, all of this uh, will go on archive next week, I promise. It's here. I just need to make a few corrections, and uh, I promise. I, I, finally, I'd, I'd like to thank all my co-authors, uh, funding agencies, and uh, organizers of the conference for uh, uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, any questions? Wonderful. Thank you, Yoshiki. That's really, really beautiful work. Fun to see all these new developments in readout. I'm sure there are some questions from the audience. We have a few minutes for questions. Adrian. So, first of all, thank you for your nice talk. Um, I was wondering that you're putting a lot of effort into quantifying the effect on T2, but one of the main things that we tried to do in the past was get rid of the photon so that we could apply gates if, say, you're... Sorry, I'll... Yeah, uh, it echoes a bit. I'll try to ask it more slowly because I speak a bit fast. Um, so one thing we tried to do in the past was to deplete the photons for the purpose when, say, doing an error correcting cycle, you want to start applying gates again to minimize the effect on the gate errors when you're using a post-measurement qubit. So I was, I was wondering if, um, besides the effect on D2, you've also tried to measure the effect on the ability to do uh, gates directly after the measurement. I think you were asking about like how quickly uh, I can uh, resume with the gate, gates after, the, after doing a readout, right? Yeah, and you're exactly right that this, this filter is also good for that because uh, as soon as you stop your readout pulse, the, the line width of the re resonator goes to like 200 megahertz. So it, it's like it, ten, it takes like 10 nanoseconds to uh, deplete the photon by factor of an order of magnitude, like four, right? So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, and it works like that. Good, I think we have time for one more question. I realize it's getting late, but this is such a cool technique and the paper is not yet on the archive. So if you want to get the details, now is the opportunity. Um, uh, very nice work. So I was wondering, uh, since your nonlinear filter is also getting driven uh, by you know, quite a lot of photons, have you noticed if that has any 
uh, harmful impact on your qubit. I mean, based on your readout fidelities, it looks like it does not. But do you have any comments on that? Yeah. Um, so uh, we did some budgeting of the fidelities, and we do see some back action on the qubit. But uh, we think that this, this is mostly because of the a number of photons that go into the readout resonator and not the, the nonlinear filter, because only the photons in the readout resonator interact directly with the qubit. Right? And yeah, if you, yeah, I didn't show the plot here, but uh, there are about uh, 20, uh, 20 photons in the uh, readout resonator at this point, and 60 here, because it's in the high excitation branch. And, uh, and the uh, critical photon number of our device is 12. So that's much higher than the critical photon number. So that must be doing something bad. So yeah, the next thing we should do is to decrease the chi dispersive shift so that the critical photon number is higher. And hopefully, we can get rid of the uh, non-QND effects. Great. So in, in the interest of time, let's thank Sonata-san one last time. Good. And next up, we have uh, Florian Wallner from uh, Stefan Philipp's team uh, telling us about Fluxonium qubits and operations on them. So Florian, take it away. OK, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I hope you all had a, a nice conference so far. So I'm a grad student working actually with Stefan Philipp I'm a few hundred meters in, I guess, this direction. So I guess uh, yesterday already some people of you um, have already seen our labs and got a glimpse of what it's working at WMI. So um, my talk today, um, as you can probably already guess from the title, will be all about fluxonium qubits. Um, since this is a um, superconducting circuit conference, I guess that there might be a lot of people who are already familiar with this concept, but to just bring everybody on the same baseline, um, here's a short introduction to fluxonium qubits. So in principle, uh, flexonium looks, from the circuit-wise, very similar to a transmit qubit. You just have an additional inductive shunt, which together with the Josephson junction actually builds uh, a loop where you can penetrate a magnetic field through. And typically, what you do is you actually bias the um, flexonium at the half integer flux point, which gives you a potential that has this nice double well behavior. Um, with that, what you get is our two low-lying states and um, multiple higher states where they're actually much further away. So this qubit in general comes with um, three key advantages. The first thing is actually people have shown very long T1 times, so you can actually reach values uh, north of a millisecond. And it comes basically from two facts. The first thing is that when you go down in frequency, you actually win a lot in T1 if you can reach the same quality factor since it gets inverse with your transition frequency. And the transition frequency for the flexonium qubits at the half integer sweet spot is typically below one gigahertz. And then the second thing is that actually your matrix element between your zero and one state is actually drastically reduced where it's actually much smaller than one compared to trans ones which typically have one. The second thing here is actually which becomes obvious if you actually look at the spectrum here is that the second excited state is actually much further away. So your computational states are much more isolated. It actually means that for um, gate operation and such, um, leakage is most of the time not a problem. And the third thing is actually that um, there are some hints that you might reduce actually crosstalk in larger devices because microwave engineering at low frequencies can be easier. So for example, impedance matching like that. So there are some hints that once you scale up, that might be better than transmons. OK, there's one caveat to that. Since you have this low transition frequency, the qubits are actually highly thermally excited, which actually means that if you want to perform any experiment, you actually have to employ some sort of reset to basically get rid of this thermal excitation at the start of your experiment. <clears throat> So to directly jump into our experiments, this is actually the chip that um, we are using for the experiment in this talk. So um, we have four single flexonium qubits, uh, all with individual readout resonators and all coupled to a common feed line. And every qubit has a flux line to bias it at this half integer flux point. And then we have additional microwave drive line down here to actually perform gate operations. So for the qubit that we used for this talk is actually we have an average T1 time of 150 microseconds and a T2 star time of roughly 80 microseconds. Um, what 
you can see down here is that we actually basically variate the um, flux bias around this half into the flux point. And what we observe is that the T1 time actually stays comfortably north of 100 microseconds. But the T2 star time actually exhibits this sharp speed bump behavior where basically only at the speed spurs you really have a significant T2 star time. So another thing that will be important later on is actually single qubit gates. And what's sort of unique to our setup is that we can actually perform single qubit gates with high fidelity, so close to actually four nines, through the actually microwave drive line and the flux line, almost with similar performance. This is actually quite nice because that actually means we can get rid of the microwave drive lines in future devices, which would make things much easier because we can then just control your flux union qubit with a single line. Okay, so let's come to the outline of my talk. So these are the two things that I would actually like to focus on today. First thing is actually qubit readout, and the second thing is qubit reset. So let's first focus on the readout. Um, this might be obvious, but um, why do we actually need readout? Of course, if you have a very high reader fidelity, you need to do less averaging, so data acquisition can be much faster. And this is especially important for calibration and tune-ups, and also it's which will we see later on is actually essential for a lot of reset protocols. Second thing, which might be a bit further into the future, is actually dynamical circuits. We actually perform mid-circuit measurements, and then depending on these measurements, with classical logic, we will basically perform operations on other qubits or even the same qubit. And um, there's actually uh, was already a nice poster by uh, IBM Group, which basically did um, a state teleportation protocol, so something like that, on a 100 qubit device. Um, problem here is that when you basically use the readout in a mid-circuit fashion with feedback, then basically you care about single operation performance because your readout is no longer something at the end to just measure the state, but it's more like an actual gate operation in your circuit. Okay, so what's important for the measurements I will show you next is that actually we don't have a parametric amplifier yet, so every measurement that you see uh, in, the coming, uh, in the upcoming slide is actually done without any parametric amplifier. Okay, good. So um, how do we perform readout of flexonium qubits? It's actually something that you have seen in the past talks. So it's actually also dispersive readout. So we couple our flexonium qubit dispersively to our reader resonator, and then it's coupled to a common feed line. And what we actually achieve at the sweet spot is roughly a dispersive shift of 3 megahertz. Um, <clears throat> to now evaluate our readout performance, what we do is actually post selection, um, which was also shown earlier. So we actually measure, do a first measurement, and that projects our mixed state into an eigenstate, so either zero or one. If it's one, we basically throw it away and just only take the zero states. And by that, we can basically measure um, how good we can basically measure the zero state, and by uh, inserting another X gate, also can measure the one state. Another thing that's actually very important is the Q&Dness, and this we measure by basically applying a pi over two piles and then doing two consecutive measurements and basically measuring the correlation. So here are the um, first readout results. So what we achieved uh, through this post-selection is basically a qubit excitation ratio, a residual qubit excitation ratio of 0.8%, and with that we can basically get a readout fidelity of up to 98.4%, in roughly 1.2 microseconds, with actually more than 10 photons on average in the reader resonator, and actually also a very high q and ness of roughly 97%. So the question now here is, um, is this all? So how can we actually make the readout better and also faster? And there might be a way, if you actually do simulations of your fluxonium dispersively coupled to the readout resonator, then what you find is that if you change the flux with which you bias your fluxonium qubit and you plot the dispersive shift, then you get a very rich landscape. And since for the fluxonium qubit, the dispersive shift is mediated through higher lying states, and every time one of these higher lying states actually crosses a resonator level, you get these avoided crossings here. So let's think a bit about what would be our wish list. So ideally, our sweet spot here, this is the half, in, uh, half integer flux point, so this is our speed spot where we like to operate the flexonium qubit. Here, we would actually like to have a very, very low dispersive shift, such we don't suffer from residual photons in the resonator. That actually means that we could actually reach very high T2 times. And then the idea here is that during the readout, we actually do a flux pulse 
to a um, point in this dispersive shift map where we can actually have very, very high dispersive shifts, and that we can have very high SNR and actually very fast qubit readout. So this is the theory. The experiment looks a bit different. So this is actually the dispersive shift measured against different flex amplitudes for the device that we are currently using. Um, it's a bit off since we didn't target the qubit parameters that well. Um, but anyway, the question is, can we, can we use that? And what we find here is that we already have the highest dispersive shift in this map at the sweet spot. But so the idea here is that we can perform actually perfect phase readout. And for perfect phase readout, you actually would like to satisfy this condition that chi is equals kappa half, where kappa half is basically, uh, kappa is the line of the resonator, which in our case is roughly a megahertz. So what we would like to do is basically go to this point here where actually two chi is equal to also one megahertz. So actually to perfectly satisfy this condition. And with that, we can actually improve our readout uh, even further to actually break this 99 barrier in roughly 600 nanoseconds. And of course, we would actually like to in the future with a device that also ha shows these avoided crossings to actually explore more like how far can we push that. But this is sort of a good starting point. This is also, I got this to work very recently, so this is a very preliminary result, and that also the upcoming experiments I show you, they do not um, include this yet, but of course in the future that might be um, things to think about. Okay, so the second part of my talk is now qubit reset. Um, again, why do we need a reset? And as I've shown you, uh, told you earlier, um, we're working with low-frequency flexonium qubits, and we actually have to um, remove the uh, residual thermal excitation that we have. Um, otherwise, um, you always start with a perfect uh, with a mixed state. And the second thing, um, the method I've already shown is post-selection, but this is not scalable since you also throw away a large part of your data. And then third, there are certain algorithms which actually require an active qubit reset. For example, something like error correction where you read out your ancillary qubits and then you also want to reset for the next basically round of correction. So the question is, how bad is it really? And our qubit has a transition frequency of 1.4 gigahertz. And when we actually measure the thermal population, we actually get this curve here. So we actually have a very high excitation ratio of 48%. And the question is how to remove that. And the first method we implemented is actually a flux reset. And what we do here is that, um, keep in mind that the flexonium is in principle a flux tunable qubit. So what we can do is basically, this is currently, this is our normal operation point. And what we can do is we change the flux and go up to a point where the um, zero one transition uh, has a much higher frequency behind a filter. And there we can basically wait, let the excitation decay, decay and then go back down. And by that we can basically reset the qubit to roughly 2% residual qubit excitation, which corresponds to 17 millikevins or drastic reduction. The only problem here is that actually it's very time consuming. So if you look at the, um, the sequence here is that basically we spend multiple hundred microseconds up here and then perform our gate operations or our experiments, which basically means that most of the time you're just waiting to your, until your excitation decays. So the question is how can we do that faster? And the answer to that is actually to perform an active reset. So what we do here is basically we again measure our qubit and project it in one of the eigenstates of the C basis, and then with a fast FPGA-based feedback, actually um, perform um, an operation depending on the qubit state. So if it's zero, we do nothing. If it's one, we basically apply a conditional X gate. And by that, we can actually convert the discarded data that we would otherwise throw away in post-selection. This feedback sequence takes roughly a microsecond, so it can be much faster. And so now what we would actually like to do, we would like to compare the different reset methods. And so we are looking for an experiment which basically um, tells us how good is the reset depending on different initial states. And how we do that is basically, again, by using post-selection. So we want to have a very good defined initial state where we basically, again, only take, uh, perform a measurement and then only take the ex uh, experiment when the initial state was a zero. Then we actually perform a, um, a pulse of varying um, amplitude to basically have initial, uh, different initial states on the Bloch sphere, and then we perform one of 
four experiments. So the first thing is basically we, we don't do anything, we just measure the excitation ratio. The second thing is basically we apply this pulse and then wait a T1 time. The third one is this active reset where we perform a measurement and do a conditional pi pulse. And the fourth is to do this flux reset. So this is the, um, the actual experimental data. So what you see here, these are the different rotation angles around the Bloch sphere, and this is the excitation ratio that you have. So for doing no reset, what you find is actually perfect Rabi oscillation, so you basically just rotate around the Bloch sphere. Then if you wait an additional T1 time, of course, what you also see is Rabi oscillation, but damped because your qubit has time to actually formalize with the environment. And then the two important, um, important curves are these two, the flux reset and active reset, and what you see here is that there is not really a dependence on the initial state, which of course is great. And what you also see is that um, the, um, if you compute the average excitation ratio, basically averaged over all these different initial states, then what you see is that actually the active reset can outperform the flux reset by roughly 1%. And what should also be kept in mind is the flux reset takes multiple hundred microseconds, but the active reset it only takes one microsecond, so it's actually two orders of magnitude faster. So this already brings me to the end of my talk. So um, I've shown you that you, how we can do high fidelity control of signal fractioning qubits, especially focusing on qubit readout and qubit reset. And I've shown you how to actually first results on flux pulse assisted readout. And for the future, of course, what we would like to do is actually to um, have this flux pulse assisted readout really on an optimized qubit chip where we really see these avoided crossings and see how far we can get with that. Then also, of course, what would be obvious to integrate a parametric amplifier like a tupa into our system and see how far we can push the readout fidelities. And then another project which is going on in our group is actually to perform um, um, two qubit gates using, for example, uh, one of these devices that we currently have here. So with that, um, I think I used up my time, and I want to take the last seconds to actually thank uh, the wonderful team that we now assembled in Munich, uh, in particular fabrication people who put a lot of effort in building these devices. And um, yes, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Florian, for a very, very cool talk. Really lots of cool developments, and also a nice uh, video here that sets a high <laughs> standard for the rest of us with groups. Very cool stuff. We have time for a few uh, questions. Uh, great uh, question here. Uh, for your uh, flux pulse uh, uh, assisted reset, uh, why do you need to wait 500 microseconds uh, I would imagine that your T1 would be significantly lower when you're up there compared to sweet spot. So, uh, yeah, so why 500 microseconds? It seems long. Uh. So, sorry, 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 can you repeat that? Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll just... Why do you need to wait 500 So can you hear me? Perfect. So if you, if you want to make it really good, then you have to wait a very long time. There, it's just um, basically we, we swap the parameters. Typically what we do in an everyday experiment is actually do it much, um, um, much shorter, like 200 microseconds. Um, because in principle, if you really want to get very low um, excitation ratio, then I guess the post-selection method is much better. So for example, for the readout fidelities, that's what we do typically then in the end. Yeah, thank you. Very nice results. Uh, the, uh, I was wondering, uh, given that you have a very good uh, fidelity of readout and, uh, and of gates, how do you explain the 2.7% uh, error of, uh, of the reset, uh, the active reset? Do you understand the, the error budget of the active reset? Mm. Yeah, so, f I mean, first of all, there's sort of, um, there's a, um, basically an error by, by waiting. So we basically, there's a latency um, that we have to wait until the device basically um, figures out if it's a zero or one. And then in addition, there is a waiting time because our resonator is still populated. 
So we didn't put uh, in uh, already implemented clear pulses where you basically empty the resonator with your measurement pulse. So there we have to wait because otherwise basically the pi pulse doesn't hit the qubit because it's still at a different frequency. Um, that's one error. Um, yes, uh, then also of course um, it could be that um, you have additional, um, um, your pi pulse could be not that good. That's also, yeah. One question all the way in the back. Last one. So when you are at these avoided crossings, do you think your dispersive assumption, like your Hamiltonian is still dispersive in, within the dispersive regime, does it still hold when you are going down these uh, lines as you change the flux? Sorry, can you repeat that? This is uh, so your readout resonator, when it crosses the higher levels of the fluxoniums, does yeah. this dispersive regime uh, assumption still hold at that point, or does it break down? <laughs> <laughs> does your dispersive regime uh, assumption still hold when you go to these uh, avoided crossings with the higher level of the fluxonium? Are you con? So why don't we pick that question up at the Hofbrau Keller later today. Good, so let's thank the speaker one last time. Thank you. Okay, so the last uh, presentation of uh, today is by uh, Sue Meru Hasra from Yale, who will tell us about uh, nonlinear interactions between a qubit and a readout resonator. So, Sue Meru, please take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Shumeru Hajra and I'm a postdoc at Yale University with uh, Professor Michel Devore. And it's a pleasure to be here and part of this amazing conference. Uh, today I'm going to talk about readout of uh, a qubit which does not have a linear coupling with the readout resonator. And yeah, so the ideal qubit readout should have the following properties that there should be no fundamental limit on how fast you can do the readout or uh, like how precise you, you should be able to do that readout. Second, it should be QND. And third, you, will, you would also like your uh, readout to be high efficient, highly efficient. And uh, purely dispersive readout uh, represented uh, like this Hamiltonian has all these properties. So fundamentally, there should be no limit uh, in the readout speed or fidelity. And in uh, circuit QVD, this is typically achieved uh, uh, via charge charge coupling between, for example, a transmon qubit and the readout resonator. And then uh, we probe the readout resonator with a tone near its frequency, and then the qubit information is uh, encoded in the uh, uh, phase of the outgoing signal. And for better and faster readout, you would want a larger kappa so that the photons leaks out of the resonator fast. You want a uh, larger uh, intracavity photon number, and it also depends on the ratio of uh, chi and kappa. So this is what we want, large kappa, large n bar, and large chi. And uh, unfortunately, the dispersive readout in circuit QAD is only an approximation, and behind this, we have two important approximations, which is the dispersive approximation and the rotating wave approximations. And as we try to uh, push this parameter higher, these break down, and we have detrimental effects because of the underlying uh, linear Hamiltonian that we start with. For example, if you want to increase uh, this dispersive in interaction, you have to either increase G or reduce delta, and that leads to partial decay of the qubit because now the qubit inherits losses from the resonator. And there are uh, mitigation strategies, for example, using a partial filter to suppress, uh, suppress such decay. But then you also have these uh, non-RWA terms in the Hamiltonian, which become significant as you uh, ramp up the readout tone. And that leads to uh, uh, what is uh, known as the readout photon-induced uh, state mixing or state transitions. And uh, this is also detrimental because you lose your fidelity and also QNNS. Another uh, bottleneck, which is not directly related to this approximation, but also limits the readout fidelity, is the presence of a TLS near the qubit frequency. And when you are uh, driving the readout tone, the qubit is stock shifted down and also defaced, so it can exchange energy with the lossy TLS. And that also reduces its T1 during the readout, and that leads to infidelity. 
So here uh, we will introduce a multimodal circuit-based approach, so where we encode uh, the qubit in one of the modes of the multimodal circuit and keep this mode uh, linearly uncoupled from the readout resonator. And we'll show that uh, due to no linear coupling, it's intrinsically parcel protected. And then uh, this circuit will also have a new uh, set of selection rules for uh, this kind of multiphoton transitions. And uh, it can provide certain uh, protection against uh, these nonlinear transitions if the frequencies are uh, chosen wisely. So multimodal circuits have been introduced uh, over a decade now. And this is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the first uh, proposal of multimodal circuits in circuit QED. Since then, uh, it has been used as uh, multi-qubit processors for novel uh, readout schemes and also to detect uh, charge noise in, in, in a spatial, uh, like in the spatial charge noise. So here uh, we call our multimodal circuit Daimon. It has two uh, modes of oscillations, uh, this quadrupolar, quadrupolar mode and uh, dipolar mode. And these two modes, have, they have a very strong uh, cross-cut interaction between them. So we use the quadrupolar mode as the qubit mode and the dipolar mode as the mediator mode. The reason is the following. So we have this dipolar mode uh, coupled to the readout resonator like uh, a transmon. So we have this uh, charge-charge coupling between the mediator mode and the readout resonator. And then you have a, a very strong cross cut coupling between the qubit mode and the mediator mode. And ideally, if the junctions are symmetric, there is no uh, linear exchange between the qubit and the readout mode. So that's why you get intrinsic parcel protection. But due to this strong uh, cross cut interaction between the two modes, effectively you get a dispersive shift uh, between the qubit and the readout mode, what you can use to directly read out the qubit mode. And the strength of this dispersive interaction depends on this cross cut uh, interaction and also the coupling G and the delta between the mediator and the readout mode, but it does not depend on the uh, detuning between the qubit mode and the readout mode. So this allows you uh, certain freedom to choose uh, the frequency of uh, the qubit mode with respect to the readout mode. Well, uh, so this is only true when you have uh, perfect uh, symmetry in the junctions. In practice, you will have some asymmetry in the junction. So here uh, we estimated the parcel T1 assuming a single mode cavity as a function of uh, the dispersive interaction strength between the qubit and the readout resonator and uh, in presence of small uh, junction asymmetry. So we see that if you want, for example, 10 megahertz chi uh, between uh, the qubit and the readout, it can tolerate uh, up to 1% asymmetry, but this can be pushed further by taking the multimode nature of 3D cavities or uh, by incorporating uh, additional parcel, parcel filters in, in, in this circuit. So now to understand the multiphoton transitions in that circuit, so we write the full Hamiltonian the, with the full cosine, and then once we expand the cosine, we see that uh, the qubit and the mediator plus uh, res readout resonator, they are in different cosines, and that uh, leads to a, a spatial selection rules that only the interaction that causes a transition, the even transition within the qubit subspace are allowed. So for example, you obviously have this dispersive interaction term because it's even in the qubit subspace. And then uh, the terms like this, which is like, uh, which takes five photon, readout photons, for example, and creates seven, uh, readout, uh, read, uh, seven photons in the qubit mode is forbidden from the selection rule. But you will also have other bunch of terms which are uh, allowed by the selection rule, but nevertheless, they are detrimental to the readout, uh, yeah, readout of this qubit mode. So we have introduced on one additional mode, and we'll have uh, some additional nonlinear transitions, but now we have a stricter selection rules uh, for the nonlinear transitions within the qubit subspace. And we believe that by choosing the frequency uh, correctly, we can uh, make use of these selection rules uh, for uh, uh, faster and better readout. So this is uh, our uh, experimental device and the choice of frequency. So we choose the mediator mode at around 4 gigahertz. The qubit mode is around 6 gigahertz. And the readout cavity is chosen to be around 7.3, 7.4 gigahertz. And these are the typical nonlinearities of uh, the molecule. And uh, this is how we address the modes. So we have two weakly coupled uh, ports uh, near the chip. 
we drive them symmetrically or anti-symmetrically to address the dipolar or the quadrupolar mode. And then for the readout, we have a waveguide port, which is coupled to this cavity. So the primary purpose of this waveguide is to uh, preserve the symmetry of the circuit because we didn't want to put a strongly coupled uh, pin near to the chip. And, uh, but this uh, waveguide also acts like a high-pass filter, so it provides uh, a, a, a little parcel protection around the qubit frequency, but it heavily uh, parcel filters uh, the, the mediator mode. And now uh, we uh, made two devices. So one uh, had a dispersive interaction of uh, 1.3 megahertz, and the other one uh, with a slightly larger dispersive shift with 2.5 megahertz. And in both these cases, we kept the cavity ex external line width roughly three times uh, this chi. And these are uh, the frequencies that we measured for these devices. And now when we uh, take the coherence data, we see that the T1 of these two modes are uh, kind of similar, and uh, they are uh, primarily limited by non-radiative uh, uh, losses. And uh, this mode mediator is now heavily parcel protected via this waveguide parcel filter, and the Q1 mode is, uh, the qubit mode is essentially parcel protected from its symmetry. And we also see uh, similar uh, T1 numbers for this uh, other device, where uh, the interaction strength is twice uh, compared to the first one. So now uh, we make use of this uh, dispersive interaction to do a direct readout on our qubit mode. And we have a 250 nanosecond integration time. And we use roughly uh, 23 photons uh, in the readout cavity. And uh, we got uh, yeah, we got about 98.5% fidelity, and this is log scale, by the way. And here we start to see some uh, onset of nonlinear transitions, which is uh, almost 1%, like when you sum both these cases. And uh, our primary bot bottleneck here is the T1 decay from excited state to the ground state. But now, since we have a uh, phase preserving amplification, we can use the uh, use a multi threshold and post select out all the nonlinear transitions that happen because they are uh, uh, they are uh, uh, at a location which is different from where we expect zero and one and using that we can push our readout fidelities to ninety nine percent for the same uh, choice of para readout parameters and currently uh, it 's basically limited by uh, the small kappa that we have so now if we want to uh, we can also, tr also try to push the readout fidelity by putting more photons. And when we do that, initially we see a, a small increase in these nonlinear transitions, but uh, around 40, 50 photons, there is a, a sudden uh, surge in these nonlinear transitions. And then we try to understand uh, these, un uh, these transitions and like what's causing them and where uh, this population is leaking into. So for that, we perform this uh, experiment, which is very similar to uh, the experiment done by uh, Daniel Sank and others uh, in Google. So first, we prepare uh, the molecule in uh, certain Fox states up to uh, uh, certain levels. Like um, here, we capped up to three excitations in the molecule. And we perform a readout. And then we can identify their locations, and uh, the circles are the c three sigma boundary around their uh, mean, mean position in the phase space. And then we can use this to identify uh, where these transitions are happening. If it is going into one of these circles, we identify it as that state. And if it is going anywhere outside, it's basically some higher states that we are not able to measure uh, in this readout. So then we perform these following experiments. We either uh, start from the ground state of the molecule, or we put one quanta in the qubit mode. And then we apply a stimulation pulse for one microsecond, and we vary its amplitude so that the photon number is varying from 0 to 500. And then we uh, let it empty for half a microsecond and finally do a, a like, low power readout. And this is, uh, yeah, so this is what we got. So we, we started from the qubit in the one state. So this is where I expect my population. There is some T1 decay, and there is, we see like there are uh, like sudden population in these states. And also, mainly, it's going to uh, the outlier. So we can now also uh, do this for the ground state and the excited state and track 
where this population is leaking as a function of photon number, we see there are uh, different features. So when we start from the ground state, from just a uh, frequency analysis, it appears that uh, it's going to the zero, uh, sorry, zero Q4M state, absorbing two readout photons. So it's like a photo transition that you see in transform, which is allowed in this Hamiltonian. And also here, when you start from one Q0M, it's roughly going to, like in this large peak, it's roughly going to 3Q3M. So, but there are also other uh, small features in this uh, plot which uh, we don't fully understand yet, and we are currently working on a Floke Markov simulation for this whole molecule and the readout cavity to understand them better, and we hope that uh, with that uh, as a guiding principle, we can uh, place our frequencies so that we can uh, push these transitions like higher in photon number, and, and we would, we'll be able to put uh, more photons for this readout. So to summarize, we have uh, shown a, a scheme where we can have a dispersive interaction without linear coupling and how it's intrinsically parcel protected and describe the selection rules for this molecule. And we have presented uh, the preliminary results from our first device on readout and multiphoton transitions. And going forward, we now uh, want to increase chi and kappa to do an even faster readout. And we are uh, using this Floke Markov uh, simulation to sort of uh, target right frequencies where uh, these nonlinear transitions are suppressed. And uh, that allows us to also exploit the selection rule of uh, this molecule. With that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all my group members, in particular Wei Dai. So he has really spearheaded this project. And thank you uh, for your attention. Very, very cool work, Samari. Thanks for presenting that. Really a lot of cool physics. We have time for maybe one or two quick questions to round out the day. If you haven't had a chance to ask a question all day, now is your chance. Thank you. So uh, I was just wondering, so you're trying to identify this special choice of frequencies where you can suppress these transitions. Um, compared to the work you showed about uh, from Martinez group from uh, many years back, doesn't having two qubit modes going to give rise to more possibilities for such transitions? So having this extra mode has, uh, like opens up another po line of possibilities for nonlinear transitions. But now uh, you don't have any parcel effect and on the qubit mode, and you don't care about the parcel for the other mode. So you can now uh, cover a larger range of frequencies, and you can only use these nonlinear transitions, like where they occur in frequency space, as your guiding principle. OK, thanks. Hi, thanks. Um so you showed two devices, and it, it looked like they had different um, chi shifts. So I was wondering if that was deliberate, or, and also if you could comment on, on how you tune that chi shift. Um. Yeah, so this is a cartoon image of uh, the device, but you can see like we basically made this age, age patch like longer so that it now couples more strongly to the 3D cavity. And yeah, so this was deliberate and in the next uh, design we are actually targeting something around like eight to 10 megahertz of chi. So, and also like making the 3D cavity narrower so that the field is like mode is more concentrated. Okay, so uh, let's thank the speaker one last time. And uh, before you get up, I believe uh, Stefan has an important announcement about uh, the logistics. Yeah, the, the moment we've all been waiting for. So the conference dinner uh, made possible by Orange Quantum Systems, Q-Control, and Q-Blocks will be now going to take place at Hofbräu Keller at Wiener Platz. We have shuttle buses leaving at 6.10 downstairs, so you can use the time until then for a bio break or a last drink or whatever. Um, if you want to go there by yourself, the dinner will start officially at 7, so you can use other modes of transportation if you prefer that. 
But uh, shuttle buses will leave at 6.10 and they will probably not wait for you. So better be, be prepared. And uh, I think we'll have a great evening there. Um, I wish us a, yeah, well, great ending of this very insightful day and um, looking forward to continue the discussions over there. Thank you for joining us here.